Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. The internet is full of half-truths and all-out lies. We've all seen them, and many people on social media complaining about it. Here's your chance to show and prove. WorldAfropedia.com is a black-owned and operated encyclopedia. There are several thousand articles, but we need help. We can't uncover all the truth ourselves. So please, join us and become a writer, editor, or blogger for WorldAfropedia.com today. Every little bit counts. We owe it to the future generations to put the truth out there. Visit WorldAfropedia.com, the African-centered encyclopedia, a global database of African knowledge for the purpose of bringing about global African wisdom and understanding. WorldAfropedia.com There's the pitch to the enemy. Makes a cut. In 1988, Colorado was nationally ranked in the top 20 for the first time in a decade. Touchdown! One of the things that happened at Michigan when I was a coach there is we recruited the great black athlete. And I learned that you can't win without the great black athlete. It wasn't true in every person's mind, but that's how I felt. The guys that I played with that was on that team, we were from the hood. And when you go to the hood, you recruit the hood, the hood is going to be on campus. In 1988, the population of the city of Boulder was less than 1% African American. On campus, among 23,000 students, fewer than 400 were black. It has not been easy for black athletes historically in Boulder going back to the 60s when they showed up on campus there were issues yeah I mean they're not used to inner city black guys you know uh, and inner city black guys is is not used to you know the culture of Boulder up through 8th grade I did not have one white classmate, neighbor teacher, teammate or friend. I thought as a kid that, you know, white people were by and large television stars. You saw them on television. Football, I was in my element, you know, I, mean, I got my helmet on, no one really can see me and, um, you know, the crowd is cheering, but when the crowd is gone and the cheering stopped, I'm a young black kid in a big pool of white people that I don't know, that, that look at me strange, I look at them strange. You know, every time that you went out and about, you just thought that you were labeled and people looked at you as a nobody. You were here on a free ride and, you know, you were, uh, you were getting ready to cause trouble every time you went out. You know, that, that didn't feel good at all. We're recognizable because we're bigger, because we're black, because we're wearing athletic gear. And the times you're walking around campus and there's just a cop car just following you as you walk around campus at night. There was reports back in the day that uh, police department here in Boulder would ride around with the CU media guy to identify guys that may or may not get in trouble. We all knew if there's a skirmish, you're going to be pulled out of it, and and you're going to be you're going to have to deal with it, and you're not going to get the benefit of the doubt. You know, you got to look at all those elements and and see, you know, the clash. You know. You, when you come from a certain neighborhood or a certain area, you're not used to people calling you nigga. At any given course of wherever you're from. And that was just like a daily thing that we were in, we went through. And uh, it was hard to accept. I mean, you know, it, you got different people telling you to turn away. Don't even listen to it. Just walk away. But, I mean, your manhood is telling you to challenge that issue. Eric was in the restroom and, you know, a group of white guys went in there and so I called him racist slurs and dumped him. He ran out and ran to me. You know, as he was trying to tell me, one of the guys hauled off and hit me. 
Uh, well, my natural reaction was to hit him back. I don't think they even, you know, looked at the reason why. I just think all they saw is a see you football player broke someone's jaw. On Halloween, there was a crowd of about maybe four or five people, and they decided that they just wanted to, to come mess with me. They, and they kicked my car, and a fight ensues, and police is right over there. I just remember trying to explain to the police, and the girl that was with this group just yelled, won't you just shut up, you stupid N-word. I was young, I reacted wrong, got highly upset, and I just slapped her. And I just remember the police telling me, now your black ass is going to jail. I've never been in trouble a day in my life. I've never even been suspended from school. At that point in time, I was ready to go. I just didn't want to be in Boulder anymore. After 18 arrests and 65 complaints against players, Sports Illustrated ran a national story about them, complete with yearbook photos arranged like mugshots. And then they put that out there, like, hey, they, they recruiting these thugs, these gangsters, you know, to play at Colorado. It's like, whoa, I'm not no gangster, I'm not no thug. I, like, I think just about everyone in, in our freshman class went to his office at one point and said, Mac, I want to transfer. Context of white supremacy, Dusty Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Monday, September 19th, 2016. So I have been told uh, we should be here on Wednesday. Uh, I stated yesterday, anyone who's listened to this broadcast, I state consistently sobriety would be best under conditions of white terrorism. That includes tobacco, cigarettes. We don't need that either to help us solve this problem. I guess this coming Thursday, the New York Times, they just had a big report about uh, a resurgence of the effort uh, on the part of some black people uh, to get rid of the deliberate targeting uh, of black people, specifically with menthol cigarettes. They are especially addictive. Uh, black males uh, have the highest rates of lung cancer in the area of the world, no coincidence, uh, they submit that that is directly attributable to the marketing of menthol cigarettes to black areas. Uh, they have a lot of great research, uh, and specifically one paper, uh, talked about it yesterday, melanin and nicotine. Very interesting research. You should check that report out. I posted it on my Facebook page last week that was in the uh, New York Times about uh, racism. And, and in my view, it's chemical biological warfare against black people in the, forms of, in the form of cigarettes, menthol cigarettes, tobacco products. But that is Wednesday, normal broadcast time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. The audio segment you heard at the beginning of the program uh, from the 30 for 30 documentary, The Book of Lucas. Uh, it's about the University of Colorado's uh, football program and uh, the white coach uh, brought a lot of black athletes uh, out to Colorado to play on the football team and racism, white supremacy ended up being a big part of the story. Very interesting film. You can check it out. They go more into detail about their experience. But uh, our guest for today's broadcast, he has a new report that we're going to talk about that deals specifically uh, with the abuse and terrorism that black males experience on historically white colleges, universities, uh, and that report, it instantly reminded me of that segment from that documentary film. You have to kind of keep your memory because uh, we'll get to that later in the program. There's some other things that I want to discuss uh, before we get to that. Our guest for today, he's been on the program many times, one of our favorite guests uh, over the years. Always great to hear some of his views, insight uh, on the system of white supremacy, suggestions, things we can do to try to solve some of these problems. He is an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Texas A&M. His research interests include philosophy, jurisprudence, Africana studies, and gender studies. His primary area of expertise is critical race theory and Africana philosophy. Always a pleasure to have him on the program. He always has great book recommendations as well, even some great guest 
recommendations. Uh, we have one of his uh, students, uh, Dr. Todd Couch, on the program. Great information. And Dr. Melissa Stein, uh, suspected racist, she was on the program earlier this year, uh, had a very uh, informative exchange with her as well. Joining us once again, uh, Dr. Tommy Curry. Uh, Dr. Curry, are you with us, sir? Yes, sir, I am. Thank you. Out outstanding. Glad, so glad we could have you back with us. I uh, appreciate you sharing a bit of your Monday evening with us. Um, for any of our listeners, this might be their first time hearing from you. Anything that you think it would be important for listeners to know about the work you do, who you are? Oh, well, I mean, you know, your introduction is always fantastic. Uh, you know, most of my work focuses on critical race theory, the permanence of racism thesis. Um, because of that, I look at white supremacy as a cultural and ideologically sustained mechanism of a white supremacist society. Um, you know, I think that a lot of times we look at the idea of white supremacy, we say it's an analytic tool, or unfortunately with social media, it becomes something that's thrown around far too often. Um, what I try to do is look at the different historical uh, instances of white supremacy. I look at the events, uh, so that kind of leads me into the research I do about black males, uh, which seems not to be as popular as it should, and the kind of genocidal logics that transform through the prison industrial complex, that transform through erasure, uh, that transforms through the denial of black male vulnerability, uh, kind of the denial of their victimhood, uh, and at large acceptance of the disposability of young black men and boys. Boys. So that research really kind of pushes back against the idea that black men are safer or somehow benefit from white patriarchy, which we know is a mechanism of a white ruling class uh, to impose certain values, structures, and organizational ideas on the rest of society. I don't want to... Uh, we will get to some of those uh, ideas which come up in your newly published report that I just mentioned. Um, but before we get to some of those, I'd really make an effort, make an effort uh, to be practical uh, with how we apply these concepts, theories, views about white supremacy, racism, and what to do. I think it's important to remind our listeners, uh, you are not just uh, a black scholar. You are a black husband. Uh, you are a black father of two black girls, uh, which we talked about before, and how you, uh, as a black parent, uh, work to protect your black girls, inform them about racism, and shielding them uh, from the terror that is going to be uh, affecting them, impacting them as uh, growing young black girls. Uh, we just had the start of a new school year. Uh, what are you all doing, I guess, with regards to working to make sure that, you know, you're not having incidents of racism happening at the school, or just things that you're trying to inform them about so that they'll be better prepared, better equipped to defend themselves? Yeah, I mean, you know, those are daily conversations. My oldest is six now. Um, so we, we have, we see a lot of little microaggressions um, that's articulated against her, uh, things about hair, uh, things about beauty. Uh, these are constant conversations that she's having with us. Um, you know, so I think, I think you know, my wife a, is a great example. My wife just finished her Ph.D. She has natural hair, uh, dark-skinned black woman. Uh, you know, so I think I think her seeing that to see the con what, a, what a loving relationship that her mother and I have, um, that we constantly reinforce that with stories, images that look like her, uh, positive narratives about young black girls, uh, ideas of success, ideas of cultural history. Um, these are all things that you know, at least the literature shows, uh, supplement you know white supremacist education or mainstream white liberal education. Uh, given that we're in Texas, the racism isn't so hidden; it's pretty blatant. Uh, so the race consciousness came about my daughter pretty early. She knew about uh, four, five, as soon as she started interacting with, you know, white children, that she was black. Uh, white children called her black, talked about her black skin, talked about her difference of hair. So the socialization to a race consciousness was very quick. Uh, the thing that we're trying to do is make sure that that's positive. We're trying to mediate any kind of negative stereotypes um, that may come to her because she's a black, young black girl. Uh, we lucked out with the school. The principal's black, her first grade teacher. I'm sorry, a kindergarten teacher. I uh, was actually a black PhD student. Um, so in that sense, we, you know, there was a kind of a, a community of um, you know positive resistance against racial stereotypes. But in the larger society, since she's still young, you know, we try to reinforce uh, play dates with black children, uh, conversations with you know black parents. Her spend a lot of time with her mom. 
you know, those types of things. Wow. That is, I want to go back just to the first portion that you shared, but I know when you were with us before, you shared uh, some of the uh, child books that you yes. uh, think are important to have. I know on your uh, Twitter page, folks can follow, you posted uh, Daddy's Little Princess uh, mm -hmm. by Todd Taylor and uh, Morgan E. Taylor. Uh, just having those images uh, to nourish black self-respect uh, in young black girls. But when you started your response, you said that your six-year-old, that she mm -hmm. has those type of conversations about people saying things about her hair, yes. about her skin color, things that she's hearing from these young white children, profound on so many levels. Just Can you kind of give us an idea of the type of things that she shared with you that people have said to you about yeah, her hair? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we, we had a long conversation about three days ago uh, about beauty, right? So she made a comment about uh, this one girl is beautiful, but she didn't think she was as beautiful. And then the question, of course, was why? You know, and she wouldn't completely say, I think the child at school said something, but she was like, oh, no, it's just, you know, I just said it, I just made it up. So we had to go through this whole exercise about um, you're a black girl. She's like, yes, black girls are beautiful. She's like, yes, black girls are smart, right? So then we're like, of course, you're smart, right? Um, you know, so just constantly reaffirming that idea. It's, I mean, part of it is the socialization. When you live in a white supremacist society, there's two kind of contradictory ideas. On the one hand, we have the historical racist idea, which says that black women are undesirable, they're ugly, they're not intelligent, etc. Right? We know that because that extends all the way from slavery forward to Jim Crow into our contemporary society. On the other hand, we have this kind of pathological view of black women that because they're more educated than black men, because they're more successful generally when you're talking about economics, et cetera, that that somehow makes them unfit, right, for partnership, motherhood, being a wife, as well as being a successful individual. So mediating between those two things, that's why, I, you know, I think her mother is such a, a important part of that because her mother shows that you are both beautiful, you can be dark-skinned, you can be intelligent, you can still be a member of your community, you can still be a professor, you can still have a Ph.D., you can still be a mother, you can still be a wife, right? So it's that communal aspect and communal socialization that we really constantly emphasize uh, with our daughters. So we know the stereotypes are out there because that's what society at large has. The other part, though, is how do you create a cultural environment that kind of gives them a, some sort of immunity or barrier to the kinds of negativity that you know white society is going to throw at their feet. You know, so that's that's a big part of what we're doing now. Constant stories, constantly talking about history. Um, you know, we we have this we have this little ritual. You know, since there's three girls and one boy in the house, um, we constantly play this game where we divide it into teams. So my wife and my youngest daughter, their team, awesome. But I let my oldest pick the you know pick the name for our team. So she's like, you know, first we're team black woman, but now we're team black girl. Right, so she she automatically picked something that reflected her and reflected positive messages. So you know that's the type of stuff we try to encourage. You know, uh, yeah, and it, you know it's a process. It's a process because you see her growing up, you see her seeing different images. You know, you see her receiving different messages, and you're constantly trying to make sure that she she has the cultural and the historical resources to interpret those messages. You know, uh, sometimes my wife and I disagree on the extent to which we should fully tell her. You know, I was raised in the South. I was raised in a segregated community. So for me, it wasn't any kind of, you know, it wasn't any soft pedaling around the issue of race. Uh, we knew very clearly what white people were. We knew that white people were different. We knew that white people lived on a different side of town. Uh, we went to, you know, schools. I went to Catholic schools, so all the white missionaries, priests, nuns were all white. You know, it was a very clear and visible presence of white people. So I didn't really have an idea. You know, I tell people constantly when I give papers, I never had an idea that white people and black people could be friends until I went to college up north uh, to UMKC where I actually saw black people dating each other, you know, or black people dating white people. I saw interracial relationships. Uh, where I was from in Lake Charles, Louisiana, that was very, very rare. It was publicly discouraged. Uh, even when you went to schools like, you know, middle school and high school, those things were, were not really uh, – uh, accepted. Uh, it was, we, were, we were told it was quite dangerous. You know, there was still vehement racism, people, you know, calling people niggers and spitting on their faces. You know, that's something that happened to me when I was in sixth or seventh grade. So, 
you know, given given that growing up with that kind of socialization, you're always, you know, my personal battle is like how much do you put on your child, you know, how much do you tell them, how much do you explain. And, you know, my wife has, my, my wife came from up north, so, you know, that's a constant debate that we have, a constant discussion we have. Um, but, you know, it's the process of raising a child, of rearing a child. Wow. Context of white supremacy. Uh, I would just submit, I know we have a lot of listeners who are also parents, and that's kind of a, a problem process that they're going through as well in terms of how much do you share, uh, how early do you share, how blunt are you with your assessment about the world mm-hmm. that we live in and problems that you're going to experience uh, because of racism, white supremacy. And I just remind uh, our listeners constantly, uh, wherever, whatever decision that you make, uh, just make sure that you understand, regardless of what you say to your child, even if you choose not to talk to them about racism, they are going to be seeing and experiencing it probably at an earlier age than you think. Uh, mm-hmm. Dr. Curry just saying his child at six already having these conversations about things she's experiencing, seeing what people are saying to her about her hair, skin color, extremely important to think about. Um, moving forward to that, try to cover as, as much as we can with the time that we have you. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts just in, in kind of in the same vein in terms of the projection, the imaging of black people uh, and how that impacts us, how that impacts our black self-respect, uh, how we think about ourselves, how others think about black people. I wanted to get your thoughts, at least to me it seems like there has been just an eruption of television programs, movies depicting black bondage, uh, the enslavement of black people just within the last three years. Uh, we have Django Unchained, uh, 12 Years a Slave, The Book of Negroes, Underground, uh, the Roots reboot earlier this summer. Nate Parker's project is about to come out uh, down the road. The Good Lord Bird, uh, which is James McBride's award-winning book, uh, is going to be adapted to a major motion picture. Uh, Will Smith's son, Jaden Smith, is going to be in it. Uh, just what are your thoughts on these, all these new images, projects, uh, dealing with the enslavement of black people? Well, I mean, I think a few things happen, right? Um, I think a lot of times, you know, black people haven't really reclaimed the historical narrative of slavery. And I think that some of these imaginings or reimaginings are an attempt to do that. The problem is is that when you produce movies where your audience or your funders are inevitably white, then the creative project some sometimes comes to reflect their mainstream disorientation or distortion of history. And I think that that's what happens. I mean, we certainly saw that in 12 Years a Slave, right? Um, we're constantly seeing white people uh, herald as the hero, uh, as the line thinker, as the man before their time, so to speak. Um, on the flip side, I think that some of this idea is certainly negative in the sense that we are dealing with um, we're dealing with some very real issues in terms of how we situate slavery next to the civil rights struggles that are going on currently, right? So when you have a situation where black people are dying, where black men are dying, where you have the constant eruption of police violence, and then you have slavery, I would ask, well, what's the socializing effect of that? How are we reading slavery? Are we reading slavery as an incident that happened to us where we were taken away from a culture or history? Is that our initiation into white supremacy and violence and then the story of our resistance against it? Or is this where we begin blackness, right? And if we're doing the latter, where we begin blackness within slavery, then we're going to have real problems in terms of rearticulating positive values like unjustification for why black lives matter. Like one of the criticisms I'm constantly making about the Black Lives Matter movement is that the way that we think about black life is merely a reaction, reaction to black death. We haven't developed a sensibility yet to positively articulate what black life is. We constantly define it based on the negativity of the corpse. We constantly define it based on the negativity of the self. We constantly define it within the sense of violence. Uh, we have blog after blog, you know, and this is what really upsets me, um, that we have such a high incidence of black male homicide in this country, both by the police and within neighborhoods, black communities, by both black men and black women. But we seem to take every opportunity to remind society of what people claim to be black toxic masculinity, black male privilege, et cetera. 
Um, and these are blog pieces. These are propaganda pieces. These are not pieces that are based in research that are talking about the concrete sociological manifestations of inequity or violence in our communities. And most of the time they get it wrong because they're using a very narrow and gender essentialist notion of intimate partner violence, intimate partner homicide, and even the notion of rape. So what we have is a anti-intellectualism posing as social awareness that is socializing a whole group of semi-activists and intellectuals into this moment that we're calling a new civil rights movement. And at the same time, we're getting the negation of blackness through slave movements that don't posit black humanity, but instead situate blackness as fundamentally dependent on the ideas and conditions of white supremacy to exist. So when you look at the global picture, or rather the national picture, which projects itself globally of black people, you look at them as always enmeshed in struggle. But then the question is, is that an honorific condition where black people are trying to fight and tear down an empire, or are we merely struggling for the recognition of our oppressors? And I think that this is one of the fundamental weaknesses that we see in the Black Lives Matter movement, that as much as we say Black Lives Matter, ultimately we see the leaders of that movement slowly assimilating and accumulating within the ranks of the upper class, either through recognition or through positions at universities or through political positions. So that means that that separation of the masses that I'm constantly talking about is reflected in the ideas and the aspirations, the ultimate end goal for a lot of people that's involved with this movement. Remember, this is a movement that involves a lot of students a lot of pseudo-intellectuals, petite bourgeois, you know, pseudo-middle-class black people, people with middle-class aspirations. Again, the problem with that is working-class black people are usually left at the behind. So while they take on the brunt of the violence, while poor black men take on the brunt of the violence, they're not part of a movement that is led by people that have the same class or political sensibilities that they may have. And that's what happens when you look at recognition as the basis of political activism rather than structural and substantive change. So those slave movies that we see have an audience. The question is, how do you tell the narrative by which one lives through those conditions? Wow. When you talk about the audience and even at the beginning of your response where you were saying that a lot of times these projects, uh, they are funded, uh, they are supported by... Uh, whites uh, who might have a white supremacist agenda with why they want these projects to be out in the first place. And particularly in your response where you said that with these slave films, it would depend if the way that we are viewing, thinking about the genesis of blackness, black people, if it starts with enslavement uh, and all the terrorism that we experienced in this process and nothing before that, nothing outside of that, that's the genesis of the black experience. I think that's a huge problem that I have uh, with these films. And it, it reminded me one of our guests from earlier this year, uh, Amy Louise Woods. I asked her about the same prospect. This was She was on before the uh, Roots reboot and some of these other projects had even come out. But in her book, uh, it's Lynching and Spectacle, which is it gets right to the core of this topic. She writes the rituals, the tortures, and their subsequent representations impart powerful messages to whites, about their own supposed racial dominance and superiority. These spectacles produce and disseminate images of white power, white unity, and serve to instill and perpetuate a sense of racial supremacy in their white spectators. And I, at least in my view, I submit that that is the exact same thing that happens when you have all of these projects. It just cements and brands Black people, this is what they are here for, to be dominated, abused, terrorized. This is how we should think of black people. This is the totality of the black experience. I think you've even written about that before. Mm -hmm. does, that, does that make logical sense? No, absolutely, absolutely. And, that, and that's what I'm saying. That's, that's part of the danger, right? If you, if you, if you cast slavery as the, as the womb or the origin of, of black existence, then you're going to end up getting uh, that type of idea as the basis of how you read blackness. And, you know, again, that's, what, that's what's so, so scary to me about how we talk about, you know, Black Lives Matter. Yeah, you know, finally they've put up demands, but what's the vision of the demand? What's the vision of, what's the notion or aspiration of the black community or black society? Uh, if, we're, if we're constantly reactive and we don't have proactive humanistic values that we've created for ourselves, our own notions of equality instead of equality with white people, our own notions of justice, this, you know, if we're always reacting to, to the negation of ourselves by white ideas and white racism, then can we really sustain a movement? Better yet, can we sustain a community within a society? 
society. You know, these questions don't seem to be asked by anyone. We're constantly in the mode where we have to endorse, like, or share somebody's post or blog that has the most ridiculousness uh, or cast ridiculousness as the basis of political analysis. And it's scary because... As you're saying, and as the, the previous guest is saying, you're, you're so, those movies socialize people. They, they, they create a certain kind of complicity with the situation because there's only so much of the brutality of slavery you can actually show on television. And if you're not getting that slavery was fundamentally an unjust and evil institution and that these are what African-descended people were actually trying to refute and, re, and, and, and get rid of, then you miss the foundational point which is that this was something that was fundamentally against humanity. So when you read a David Walker, and David Walker is making the argument that says that white Christianity is barbarism, that the idea of Christianity that justifies slavery is in itself evil, then you have to understand that that whole movement after him, the Robert Youngs, the Elizabeth Wicks, the Maria Stewarts, that the people following him take as the basis of their analysis the same assumption. So there's generations of intellectuals that start with the basis that slavery breeds the ignorance which negates the fundamental humanity of black people. The movie gives you a notion that there's humanity to be found in the white friend, in the white savior, that there's a transcendence of an institution, right? Be, so they artificially enslave you, make you suffer, create this trauma, and then you're free, you're fine. But that's not what anybody said, right? We, we just presuppose these things. We create these narratives as if they're fundamentally true. So, yeah, I think there is a real danger in the Hollywood narrative of slavery. On the other hand, you know, this is why we need more critical discussions in a more enriched black public so that they can recognize these things, right? If we continue to educate ourselves on the basis of popular ideas, right? And, you know, this is one of my, one of my biggest criticisms is that the black intellectual class uh, exists on the basis of popular ideas rather than critical ones. Like nobody pushes an unpopular idea anymore. We all agree, and if we don't agree, we stay quiet so that no one attacks us for not agreeing. That's not the way to engage some of these dominant ideological images or even a state apparatus that is funding different aspects of media representations that are disseminated to the black community. Context of... white supremacy um specifically because uh, you talked about how a part of this uh, i think one of the the themes that has become more popular uh the use of the term uh toxic masculinity uh and obviously over the last year uh most frequently i've seen that term associated with black males uh yes. bill cosby and now nate parker uh certainly yes. wanted to get your boss there's been so much uh discussion another slave flick uh his biopic on uh, nat turner uh got $17.5 million at the Sundance Film Festival earlier this year. Uh, and then within the last few weeks or so earlier this summer, the big controversy uh, 17 years ago, a white female uh, accused him of rape. Uh, he was charged. Uh, he and another black male who's also one of the uh, co-filmmakers for the Nat Turner Project, uh, Mr. Parker, was acquitted uh, in the case. Uh, but they've been talking about this. Uh, there have been lots and lots of reports, uh, black males and females, uh, for what I've seen from most of the mainstream reports, have not been in support of Mr. Parker. Uh, the bulk of the material that I've seen, uh, Mr. David Dennis Jr., he's a journalist down in Atlanta, Georgia, affiliated with Morehouse. He said, whenever there's a liberation movement anywhere, really it seems like there's black women that's either victimized, ignored, left behind, and they just kind of have to suck it up. And so it's kind of time to not have to do that anymore. This was in conversation about Mr. Parker's film. Uh, Ibram Kendi, uh, he wrote an open letter to Mr. Parker. He said, I'm writing this letter to tell you that in the end, you must stop declaring your innocence. Uh, and that's been the general tone of most of what I've heard. Uh, Jarvis DeBerry, uh, DeBerry he's a uh, journalist for the times Picayune in Louisiana, had a post uh, of a similar tone. Uh, what do you make of what you have seen of all of this? Does this jive with any of your theories about how black males tend to be discussed? Oh, absolutely. I mean, listen, first, first I have the... I'm 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 a little confused, right? In the sense that you know, I raised this pick this this problem on my my page. Um, he's accused of raping a white woman, so I'm I don't understand the argument in terms of he's victimized black women. Um, one, two, if the conversation is 
he's a toxic masculine presence, and because he's black, he endangers black women. I, I don't know what to make of that argument, you know, because before this he was criticized for marrying a white woman. So I'm 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 confused in terms of what the actual threat that people are saying that he poses to black people and black women at large is, unless it's representational. Um, the second problem I have with this is I've read a lot of those articles as well, and again, you know, blogs are very cheap. Uh, there's no need for you to actually substantiate your opinion with facts. You can, you know, approach this in terms of, well, it's a black man accused of rape. Because he's accused of rape, he is a rapist, uh, and that just kind of fulfills the public's view. Um, you know, the reality of the situation was there there was a trial, there was a case, and people were saying that, well, you know, people get off of rape all the time. That's not exactly true when you talk about black men. It's certainly not true um, both in Pennsylvania and historically when you talk about uh, black men who are accused of raping white women. Um, the, but the bigger problem I have with this, you know, is that it doesn't take much to make up a story of, of victimization by the black male rapist. So the argument about toxic masculinity is extremely problematic, and I want to give a few reasons for that. The first is toxic masculinity, or what was more appropriately called hegemonic masculinity, was never meant to be applied to black men. So if people actually read R.W.S. Connell's book on gender and power and on masculinities, um, it becomes very clear that she's talking about ruling class black, uh, white men. She's talking about men who come from imperial uh, positions, who are building empires, who are building colonies. Right. I mean, this is this is her research. Uh, furthermore, her idea and her study, the the evidence for uh, hegemonic masculinity is done on Australian boys, working class Australian boys who are in boarding schools that aspire to go to ascend into the middle and upper classes. Now, that's extremely important because the whole theory then is based, and this is why she calls it hegemonic. She doesn't call it hegemonic because it means power. She calls it hegemonic because she gets that from Gromsky's theory of ideology, of hegemony. Right, this idea that there's aspirational ideological forces that um, build in power. Now, because people in America misunderstand this term, even though it's been debated for the last 20 years outside the United States and has a very deep literature um, in masculinity studies, uh, what ends up happening is that people simply apply it to mean anybody, right? Any black person or any black male um, becomes a hegemonic masculine or toxic masculinity because black men are thought to be hypermasculine. A few responses to that. One, R.W.S. Connell herself doesn't view black masculinity as having anything to do with hegemonic masculinity. So she writes in her book that the same way that James Messer Smith came up with the idea and explained that working class white men don't even have hegemonic or toxic masculinities, but a very different and equitable basis for masculinity between men and women because they both are workers, is the same way she looks at Robert Staples' work and says that because black men have been fighting against colonization, have been fighting against white supremacy, they have very different aspirations and different socializations into masculinity. So there's lots of literature there that explains that, you know, just because someone is male doesn't mean that they're patriarchal or fall into toxic or hegemonic masculinity. The second thing is that all these blogs are written uh, in opposition to what R.W.S. Connell actually thinks. So she published an article in 2014 um, called Margin Becoming Center for World Center Rethinking of Masculinities. And that article actually says that black masculinity, or more specifically, masculinities in the global south, and she talks about like people like Fanon, people like you know Achebe. She, when she says that these black men of the darker races that are fighting against colonization are actually the model of gender that we should be looking at to base a new gender studies on. Because she says in the West, femininity and masculinity are both hegemonic. So when people make these at-large pop culture blog arguments, they're fundamentally distorting the actual argument that Connell brought about and what she meant to introduce when she utilized the term. So black men become sucked up in this history of patriarchy that the original author herself never intended black men to be a part of. She's written an article in 214. She's written several articles with different masculinity theories explaining that this doesn't even apply to working class white men. And then you have all the arguments about black men that simply don't fit with this mainstream socialization. Right? Once you get that picture, then it becomes very difficult to see how someone like Nate Parker becomes the model and example of the burgeoning toxic masculinity that exists in the United States. See, what, what a lot of people do is they just go and pick one incident. 
So they'll say, okay, Nate Parker's a rapist. Rape is caused by male domination, hence hegemonic masculinity or patriarchy. Same thing with domestic abuse. Somebody abused, Ray Rice abused his wife. Domestic abuse is caused by social domination, power, patriarchy, hence hegemonic masculinity. But see, the problem is, is that because they don't know anything about the substance and actuality of black culture, then we'd actually have to point out how there's bidirectionality. I spoke about this before, how women beat men, how from 76 to 89, black women were killing husbands at a much higher rate than practically any other group in the United States. So does that mean there's toxic femininity, right? See, you, if we create theories, that simply exist on the basis of analytics. And you see this all the time, right? You see how people say, oh, black men have problems with black women and homosexuals. That's not an actual sociological finding. That's them using hegemonic masculinity, which says that men who desire power because they're heterosexual seek to dominate women and homosexuals because those men, for them, are distortions of heterosexual ruling class male power. All right, these are all analytics. This is like, if you're this, then these things follow. So what we've done is we've created a whole culture in black studies, in understanding black masculinity, that utilizes white theories on Australian schoolboys and a ruling class in a, com- in a colonial nation or post-colonial nation, depending on what you you know understand by that term, to base it on people in the United States, on black men in the United States, who have been some of the greatest victims of white patriarchy and colonialism. Right, the terms don't fit, and because we've we've handed over gender studies to feminism. And, 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 you know, progressive alternative sexualities, there's been no arguments pointing out the incongruency between using Connell's theory and applying it to working class, poor, black and brown men. And it's completely ridiculous because they've done this work. With, even when they, if, if poor working class white men in colonial societies that can't, are the descendants of imperialists and colonizers aren't hegemonic, then I fail to see how the descendants of slaves are, right? And this hasn't clicked. But you get shares, you get clicks, because that's the mainstream way that people like to interpret black males. If we're talking about problems, then we're talking about things like misunderstandings of consent, uh, which is where we get most prevalence of rape. Uh, We're talking about a symmetrical problem where you have male-perpetrated rape and you have female-perpetrated rape. If you're talking about this problem on college campuses, then when you look at the DOJ reports from 1993 to 2013, we're talking about an average of 10,600 women being raped per year and 6,700 men being raped per year. So you have to, if you're going to make the argument that we have a rape culture and rape problem, which is fine, nobody's saying that doesn't exist, Right, but I mean, again, rape is only reported in like 0.1 percent of the population. But if we really do believe this is a problem, then it far exceeds the kinds of theories that we have to explain this phenomenon currently. This is not a phenomenon where men are just learning to rape women. This is a phenomenon where you have forcible rape, right? Where, which is our our idea of a man, a stranger raping a woman. You have you know notions of rape that are based on consent misunderstanding, and you have situations where women. Sometimes older women are forcing young boys to penetrate them. You have women that are forcing boys to have sex with them. You have women who are peers of men having sex with them in their sleep or emotionally and physically abusing them in the sense like, you know, scratching, saying that they'll accuse them of X, Y, and Z if they don't do what they want. So there's all kinds of different forces and coercion that lead to rape. That's all part of the same problem, but none of those things get discussed. They kind of fall away to the wayside when you're talking about black men and masculinity. Wow. Just to, to before we move on from this topic, the whole situation with Nate Parker, it's been uh, racist propaganda at its finest. Um, one of the quotes, in my opinion, that is most I found most profound within all of this, the New York Times, uh, when one of the first reports that they did about this situation, they talked to the uh, white woman, uh, the alleged victim uh, in this case, uh, who committed suicide in 2012. They spoke with her family. They wrote, uh, the woman's family sounded less convinced in a statement to the New York Times on Tuesday, which read in part, we're dubious of the underlying motivations that bring this to present, bring this present excuse me, that bring this to present light after 17 years, where the white woman's family even acknowledged that they are alone. suspicious about all of this coming out 20 years after, you know, the case was adjudicated and Mr. Parker was acquitted. That's number one. Number two, the Washington Post 
This was on August 27th of this year. They had, and I talk about this all the time in terms of how news information, how it's sequenced, how it's presented, that that is extremely important. So they have one report. The pursuit of capital punishment for Dylan Roof is a step backward. They have a photo of Dylan Roof, the white male who committed the terrorist attack last summer, uh, Mother Emanuel AME Church in South Carolina. The gist of the article, they're basically saying that uh, you're wrong if you think that this is justice or a victory or represents racial progress if we kill Dylan Roof, uh, that that is not the correct thing at all, that we shouldn't champion that, that life in prison without the possibility of parole, that that would be just and we would not be killing him uh, because he doesn't deserve that. That's not the right thing to do. Right next to that article, they have Nate Parker acquitted on a rape charge owes us more than words. And this talks about him just talking about this and saying that he wants to address this and and hope that this uh, motivates people to have deeper conversations about consent and rape and toxic masculinity and and all of that. That's not enough. You owe us more than that's right next to it. And in my view, keeping in mind that Dylan Roof allegedly told the victims that the reason or part of the reason he was doing this was because black males rape our women. Uh, that was right. widely reported last summer. Just your thoughts in terms of the, the propaganda, because it, in my view, this has not just been you know, an attack on Nate Parker. This has ended up just being an, an indictment of black males at large. Well, I agree. You know, I agree. And again, you know, there's no, there, in the academy, there's no defense that you can really have unless you're ra- you know labeled a radical right so there is no response to the feminist criticism that black men are rapists outside of you being labeled non-progressive right um despite how many facts you know show the show the opposite phenomena i think that what you see in those types of in those types of you know just positions is is two stories right one Black men really can't ever be innocent of rape, you know, and this is what my book is talking about. Um, you know, it says that, listen, the idea is that people thought the myth of the black rapist was a stereotype. You know, uh, Melissa Stein's work, you know, who you had on the program shows that, no, this was thought to be the biological development of black males in this society. And they started off as children. Um, they're irrational. Um, and when they hit puberty, they develop into the rapist. Uh, if you have that kind of view and it's not addressed, then there's no way you really escape the kind of biologization of this kind of violence. People really do believe black men are rapists. That's the first point. The second point is, you know, we're not doing ourselves any benefits when we say that maleness has some sort of sexual privilege over femaleness, but we can't gather how even in the 21st century we have mass shootings like Dylan Roof uh, justified, in his mind at least, on the basis of the sexual threat that black men pose to white women. So given that, given that reality, and, I mean, if you look at the data in terms of how many black men are convicted on, you know, rape or murder, and then how many are exonerated or their, you know, are misidentification, any of that type of data, and then you put that next to the fact of this at-large public view that people really do think black men are rapists, you know, even in the academy, which is supposed to be the spaces that are interrogating this kind of idea, uh, then it looks, it looks pretty bleak for black males, right? Like, if you're a heterosexual black male, all sorts of evil are placed upon you, even though we have tons of empirical data and studies that show that it's not the case. Black men are not misogynistic. Black men are not even the majority of the convicted rapists, which is what I find so interesting. That, right? Almost 70% of the rapists in this country, well, I mean, depending on the studies, right, but well over 50%, but in, in some cases closer to 67 to 70% of the convicted rapists in this country are white men. But that's not what we get. Like, we don't see blog after blog talking about white men as rapists, right? I mean, when you looked at the Brock Turner situation, you know, and this is, the again, the stark contradiction. You didn't see black feminist blogs going off on Brock Turner, saying that he was a threat to black women. And then I had to ask myself, it's like, why is this? If Nate Parker was actually tried, like went through a court with an all-white jury and was acquitted, on the basis of whatever evidence they said, and some people may say, well, look, I still think he's guilty, that's fine. The fact of the matter is he was tried, he was, he was acquitted, okay, of raping a white woman. This white boy raped a white woman, never went to trial, sent pictures of the act, and then gets a short prison stay, and, and now he's off. So while people are upset about it, you don't see that it occupying the same kind of intellectual space that, that Nate Parker did. Right, this is a white boy who didn't even have a trial, who went through nothing. And this just happened. His situation was 17 years ago. So what it shows is that there's never going to be any kind of equal treatment 
on the basis of accusation and fact. In the mind of many people, and this includes black people, black men are just violent and black men are just rapists. Now, how do we challenge that? Well, we have to keep asserting that the facts simply don't bear that out. But given the mainstay of this, you see, in this interview, like when white people say it, we think that it's a racist stereotype. When black people say it, somehow we think it's, it's the pinnacle of gender theory. And it's, that, it's in that contradiction of the issues that make us really have to fall back and say what is really being produced in these academies, right? What's being produced by people who are willing to claim that black males are in fact rapists, right? Wow. You know, context of white supremacy. Uh, again, our guest, Dr. Tommy J. Curry, uh, you in your new report, which I am going to get to, but in your new report you write, uh, this realization has both sociological and theoretical consequences because the special gendered effects of racism upon black males are de-emphasized in current attempts to study black men and boys. Their sexual vulnerability to white patriot, white supremacy is often overlooked. Now, I would ask folks to kind of take all the attention that has been focused on Nate Parker over the past two, three months uh, about the relitigation and, and defamation of Nate Parker, uh, the case that happened in Dietrich, Idaho, uh, this happened, I think, right when uh, Dr. Melissa Stein was on the program, and I was like, wow, I wish we had had Dr. Curry on, because this is right on time, uh, and it related right last time you were on the program this year, we talked about your piece, uh, This Nigger's Broken, where you talk about uh, black males that are mm -hmm. disabled, how they still suffer from the same terroristic perceptions that they're a threat. Uh, you know, you could be the next Nate Parker, even if you're a, di a disabled black male, uh, that we might have. have to, to fear that you're a rapist or some sort of brute savage. Uh, this case in Dietrich, Idaho, where there was a disabled black student, he was on the uh, football team with a mostly uh, white team, mostly white students, mostly white residents uh, in this city in Idaho. Uh, the Washington Post reported, uh, when a teammate held out his arms after football practice in their high school locker room, the student thought he was about to get a hug. Instead, he was viciously assaulted, authorities say. As the teammate restrained the victim, another football player allegedly thrust a coat hanger into the victim's rectum, according to a criminal complaint. Mm -hmm. Then a third teammate kicked the coat hanger several times. The October 23, 2015 incident has rocked the tiny town of Dietrich, Idaho. This spring, after several months of investigation, the state attorney general's office filed sexual assault charges against the three. Two of the teenagers are being charged as adults and could face life in prison under Idaho law. Earlier this month, the victim's family filed a $10 million lawsuit against Dietrich High School. According to the lawsuit, the attack wasn't a one-off, but rather the culmination of months of racist abuse by white students against the victim who was black. The victim was taunted and called racist names by other members of the team, names which included Kool-Aid, chicken eater, watermelon, and nigger, the suit alleges. In addition to Dietrich High School, the lawsuit also named 11 employees as defendants. It claims school administrators and coaches did nothing to stop the racial and physical abuse toward the victim, who was especially vulnerable due to mental disorders, including learning disabilities. The victim one of the few black students at Dietrich, let alone on his football team, was subjected to frequent abuse by John R.K. Howard, that's one of the uh, alleged perpetrators, and his fellow teammates, including aggressive humping, jumping on him from the back and simulating anal sex, according to the suit. His fellow football players allegedly gave him painful wedgies, stripped him of his clothes, and took naked photos of him in the locker room. I will stop there, and I wanted to give the full detail because I'm sure people know a lot less about this case than what happened with Nate Parker. Just, I think you touched before that we really don't have an accurate conceptualization of racism, and particularly the sexual vulnerabilities that black males experience under white supremacy to process this type of event. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. I mean, one of the things that uh, my book's actually coming out uh, on Temple University in July. Uh, so one of the big chapters in that book uh, is dealing with this exact issue, with how 
we are constantly seeing uh, over and over again the rape of, of black boys, uh, either by cops. You know, I, I think I used the Darren Manning situation a few times uh, on the show. Uh, I was aware of this this incident, actually. I, I put it in my footnotes in my book. You know, when these types of things happen, we're not linking eroticism, or in this case, homoeroticism, to the victimization of male bodies. And this is a very, very dangerous aspect to, to what we're doing now in race studies, or at least critical race studies. I mean, when you look at police violence, you know, we see anal penetration. When you look at racism, and especially like the mob mentality of, of, of lynchings that we, that we talk about so lightly now, you see the same dynamic that happened, you know, in Idaho. The reality of the situation is that black male bodies are sexualized and exploited and abused physically and sexually in many ways that we think is, is solely belongs to, to women. And the problem with us not having this conversation is that we don't have the analytical tools or the awareness to identify this kind of sexual molestation and rape as, or in this sodomization as part of racism. And, you know, and, and you'd be surprised <clears throat> just how difficult it is to, to sell people on the idea of, of black boys or black males being raped. I mean, when you look at the prison population, we have a good amount of evidence which shows that m many black male inmates are being raped by white female staffers, right? You know, there's all this sexual violence against black males, but because they're black men and they're thought primarily to be rapists and they thought, they're thought to be invulnerable to rape because they're men, right? Another ideological motive um, or, or mythology that comes ab about from the Duluth model you know, it's it's very difficult to do. I need your help with the TV. Wow, that, as I said, this case did not get nearly as much attention, and the most recent reports I've seen just from this month. Yeah, I mean, you know, every time every time we have cases of black male victimization or rape, one of the alleged perpetrators they dropped the felony charges, uh, mm -hmm. so they're going to pursue him with lesser charges. He was uh, under the age of eighteen at the time, so they're not going to. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, no. Yeah, I think there was a little bit of lag there. You know, right. the reality of the situation is that when these types of things happen to black men, um, we really do turn a blind eye to them. And even as academics and alleged researchers, <clears throat> there's this way in which when we speak about racism, we want to separate racism from gender. And when we do that, we end up putting them back together, focusing almost exclusively on black female bodies. So we talk about intersectionality all the time. We need a race gender analysis. But it seems that that race gender analysis never places black men at the helm of victimization through things that we think are, are feminine, are, are female violences like rape, domestic violence, domestic homicide, any of these types of things, violence by intimates, you know. So when this happens, people just say, ah, oh, well, isolated incident. Ah, well, not the basis of black male experience. But then when you go back through history and you start digging just a little bit deeper than what those introductory textbooks that you get in Black Studies or Africana Studies 101 or Women and Gender Studies 101 tell you, you say, wow, you have black men like Richard Wright, black men like Eldridge Cleaver, right, people like Hurden, all trying to tell you that the basis of black male fear, phobia, and brutality has a sexual and homoerotic basis. This is Fanon, right? <laughs> that every, every Negrophobic white man, you know, thinks about performing, you know, thinks about receiving fellatio from the Negro, right? So this, this is well, well on the minds of black men writing during periods of Jim Crow, racist repression in the South, and colonization. But it skips the bourgeois black academic because it doesn't fit with a kind of post-civil rights notion of discrimination, Right, intersection. I was telling my class the other day, intersectionality only works if you assume that the segregationist basis of racism has fallen away, and you get you can only get a discriminatory basis because you're talking about the ways in which identities play out in terms of recognition, and then how some people being recognized more than other people creates disparities, be it monetary, be it political, etc. But in a world where you're segregated because of your race, your identity only only tells you the kinds of violence that have the propensity to accumulate around you. So it may be the case that if you're a black woman in Jim Crow, you're raped more often because that's the type of violence that white males in the silence 
I like to perpetuate against black women. That doesn't mean that black men aren't raped in the South. It just means that that's not the peculiar type of violence or the particular type of violence that they most often experience, right? And because we don't look at racism in that way as the, as the articulation of various colonial and segregationist or Jim Crowish ideas, we can miss, completely miss the picture of this kind of brutality, despite the fact that this brutality happened over, all across the world within various colonies. So we have a kind of dishonesty and short remembering, right? Because you have to remember that when America is colonizing the world, we're at the, we're at the turn of the 20th century, right? We're, we're only 60, 70 years out of that moment where people somehow became integrated, right? And we started ad- adapting in the 1970s or late 80s these ideas of intersectionality. So these are at best, you know, 20, 30 years old. So the question we would have to ask ourselves is how do theories that have just come about in the last 20 or 30 years do so much to reframe what we think is, is possible to bodies that we know have been existing, at least in the United States, in, in relationship to physical violence and sexual violence for at least the last two or three centuries? Right? It, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to read 300 years based on an innovation in the last 30. But nonetheless, that's what people do, and that's why they miss, that's why they erase, that's why they can't see this other component of racism especially black male vulnerability. They just, you know, because under intersectionality, maleness has a privileged position. Now, post-intersectionality theories have certainly challenged that. You know, people like Matua, people like Darren Hutchinson, people like Angela Harris have certainly challenged that idea, right? Explain that black men uh, uh, experience a kind of gendered racism and that police brutality is a great example of that kind of disproportionate um, disadvantage. Uh, and even, you know, Matua's piece I've talked about a few times, you know, where she's saying that once you really test for these alleged black male privileges, you can't really find them. At best, you'll talk about, you know, income disparities, but there's only a four to six percent or uh, six cent income disparity if you're, you know, not taking consideration incarceration as your employment. And that translates to about a little less than three thousand dollars a year. So if you're if you're going to base the disparities between genders on a notion of three thousand dollars a year, where that doesn't separate black men from black women in any substantial way because they live in the same neighborhood, same house, same danger, same violence, x x y and z, then I really don't know what we're studying. You know, at some point we have to hold theories up to empirics. We have to go through and actually test what's going on. And in a world where we don't do that, we're kind of losing the point. Context of white supremacy, real important. I think when Dr. Melissa Stein was on the program, I think that was something that you uh, pointed out in terms of I think sometimes people will correctly state that the origins uh, or the continuum of sexual terrorism against black females uh, reaches all the way black to the plantation, the same would be true for black males, uh, the sexual vulnerability, uh, sexual attacks. Uh, you just have to, how far are we going to look back and make sure that we're pointing out uh, everything? Um, we look at the history of racism, white supremacy, and vulnerability of black males as well. Um, I wanted to make sure I, I touched on your new essay. Uh, you make me want to holler and throw up both my hands. Campus culture, black misandric microaggressions, and racial Battle Fatigue uh, was just published uh, just within the last uh, few weeks. Uh, that is why this piece particularly, although there's some relevance to some of the other things that we've talked about as well, I think, but the piece I opened up with from the uh, 30 for 30 documentary on the uh, black football player's experience at the University of Colorado at Boulder uh, was connected directly to this piece. Uh, for listeners who haven't read it, do you kind of want to give them an idea of what you were focusing on in that uh, report? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm. I think I'm fourth author in that report. Um, the lead, the lead author on that article is uh, William A. Smith, who's who's a scholar that you really should, uh, you know, have on the program. He he actually came up with the idea of black misandry, um, which I think is a very important theoretical um, intervention, uh, where he says says that similar to how we think of misogyny, which are specific attacks and stereotypes against women bodies, you know, black misandry is the idea that black males suffer from very specific sexual, gender, racial stereotypes, etc. Um, he's also done a lot of exploratory work on um, or create, you know, battle, racial battle fatigue, which is this kind of exhaustion that you have from, you know, microaggressions and how, you know, the, I mean, in other terms, how the stressors and environmental factors of these kinds of, you know, predominantly white env- environments really do have uh, negative effects on, on black people. Uh, so when you're talking about black men, 
Um, you know, what he's done is he's combined racial battle fatigue uh, as a theoretical framework for, exi- uh, for examining the gender and sexual microaggressions against black males. And the, P- the, the, the contribution I had to the article was kind of phrasing that within some of the work that I did on black male vulnerability and showing that these empirical or theoretical sociological constructs really do fit and show that the vulnerabilities that I've tested and see that exist within, you know, a subordinate racial, uh, racialized male identity uh, is part of that experience. So what this article did was actually look at the experiences that uh, college-educated black men or black men who are currently in college uh, had to the specific gendered notions of black masculinity. So they're, how are they reacting, how do they receive, how they articulate experiencing, you know, racial misandry or, or black misandry uh, on college campuses. Uh, so I think, the, I, I personally think the article is groundbreaking. And what it does is it substantiates a lot of the arguments that we've been having in the theoretical literature for quite some time that says that black men don't have a sense of their maleness. You know, and this is, again, this is the pushback on some of the dominant feminist literature where the idea is that because maleness is a privileged position, that black men, because they're male, don't have a knowledge about that. But when you look back throughout history, when you start examining the literatures and writings, I adamantly disagree with that. It may not be the version of masculinity you like, but black men are very clear about how their masculinity affects and impacts the way they deal with white racism and by effect how they're victimized by patriarchy right this is one of the contributions that i think jim sedenis's work uh, does, does so well in social dominance theory right social dominance theory says that within patriarchal societies because they're based within class structures that the arbitrary sets which are the things that we call like socially constructed these these arbitrary sets like race and gender etc are going to be fundamentally opposed to subordinate males. So if the white patriarchy wishes to continue itself, then it's going to oppress women, certainly, because it aims to control them. But it sees black males and other racialized males across the world as a threat to their fundamental existence, and it seeks to exterminate them. So then we would ask ourselves, if that's true, like let's assume that that hypothesis is true, then what types of things would be necessary within a society to legitimize the extermination of certain groups of males? And the types of things that Sedanizer tests is criminalization, the rape myth, poverty, the ability that these people are pathologically confined to the lower classes, all these things become becomes the rationalization for why you kill them. So then you say, well, let's go look at the data. Who suffers most from homicide? Go figure. Racialized males, right? And certainly in comparison to the to to the, you know the women of their of their specific race or ethnicity. So there's ways in which these theories accumulate. That you say, well, if there is a you know racial subordinate male hypothesis, do we have evidence for it? You know, what I really like with what William uh, A. Smith has done is he said, okay, well, let's look then at the microaggression. So we don't look at pure political extermination, which is the work that I do, or we don't look at it historically. Can we see these kinds of rationalizations put forth by a white supremacist society or by white ideas or by white privilege? And his his work has certainly shown that. So I think that what we have at this moment is an advance in black masculinity studies. I prefer to call it black manhood studies because I think black masculinity in, in itself is just an erroneous term. But if we start having this growth of black malehood studies that extends just beyond kind of the deficit models of, uh, that's prevalent sometimes in education, then we can actually start getting into the kind of the history and the actual sociological realities that these black males experience. And that's exactly what I'm arguing for in the book. You know, my contribution here in this article is saying, listen, if this is true, if we have this data, then what kinds of theories can we utilize to explain it? Because the idea, you know, this is the, this is Staples' intervention from 78 and 82. The idea that black men benefit from patriarchy does not fit if they have a social, if they're socialized into maleness as a gendered reality of vulnerability and danger to others. So the idea of hegemonic masculinity is precisely that it's not endangered by other people, unless you're talking about the violence of other males. But in this account, we see a vulnerability of black maleness that is very much stereotypical, that is very much defined by, you know, the sociological surveillance, right, the societal surveillance of these alleged criminalized bodies. And then we're looking at these black men feeling the same types of, like, frustration, shock, anger, right, anxiety, depression, hopelessness, being fearful, right? These aren't the ways that that patriarchs usually describe themselves in a relationship to a patriarchal world. So there's something about that 
gendered subordination as a racialized male that hasn't been fully understood. And I think this article does a great job in trying to, to bring that to the forefront. Hmm. One of the portions that kind of highlights you just talked about Robert Staples and even this portion that I want to read uh, highlights some of your work on this subject uh, in the reported states. Uh, Robert Staples, 1978, offered pioneering work on intersectionality and the dual dilemma of being a black male in the United States. Staples argued that in the case of black men, their subordination as a racial minority has more than canceled out their advantages as males in the larger society. Any understanding of their black male experience will have to come from an analysis of the complex problems they face as blacks and as black men. In other words, white patriarchy fails black men. The gendered sexual racism black males suffer actually distorts the values and powers often attributed to white masculinity. As political theorist Tommy J. Curry explains, the black male is not born a patriarchal male. He is raced and sexed peculiarly, peculiarly configured as barbaric and savage, imagined to be a violent animal, not a human being. His mere existence ignites the negrophobia taken to be the agreed upon justification for his death. The physical death of black men and boys is the desired result of white patriarchy as it maintains the racist social order of the United States. This racist order depends on black male corpses because black male death lessens their economic competition with as well as their political radicality against white society. Quoting a lot from your work, Dr. Curry, just anything you want to elaborate from this section of the uh, report? <laughs> you know, you know when, when you read me, I sometimes sound uh, smarter than I think I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I mean, look, I think I think that that's you know I think that that's just the that's the substance of black manhood in America. Um, you know, and, and here's I guess here's the most ironic part is that I don't think anybody denies the brutality that happens to black men. They just say that we should interpret it differently, right? Because the facts are all there. I mean, you know, when you look at incarceration, I mean, black men are like 846,000. Black women are 65,000. When you look at homicides, like at least from 2013, black men are like 5,700. Black women are 909. Like, there's clear gender disparities that show that black men get the brunt of the physical and, and you know, lethal or fatal violence or fatal force in this society. Uh, I think the problem that happens in the academy is that people just want to interpret that away, that they say that, well, yeah, black men may be, and, and actually this is the argument of sexual visibility that I just don't understand. You know, people are willing to accept the idea that, yes, black men are affected by these types of things more, but because they are, that that's somehow a privilege if they're recognized as the greatest victims. And to me, that's just nonsense. That's a genocidal rationalization. Because you basically get to say, well, even though black men are the greatest victims, they're people that we should not be focusing our energy to. And that seems like victim denial. I don't, I don't, see, that, I don't see that. You know, the irony is I don't see that happening to any other group, right? So you don't take intimate partner violence and say that, hey, you know, in 2010, the lifetime prevalence for black women experiencing intimate partner violence was 6 million, and the lifetime prevalence for black men in that same year was 4.6 million. Oh, those, are, those black men are less. They're erased. Hence, you know, they should be focused on as the greatest victim. Like, nobody would ever say that, despite the, the astronomical numbers of black men being abused by women and other same-sex partners. Yet, when it comes to something like police violence or the violence of the day that, you know, be it incarceration or, you know, police homicide, Suddenly, if you focus on black males, that means that you're committing some kind of ethical or moral error. And I just find those types of things to be nonsense. Yes, we should study both groups. Yes, we should write papers about what is the causality of killing black women. But when we're talking about a societal phenomenon, when we're talking about mass incarceration where there's this huge disparity, we should concentrate on victims. We should concentrate on all victims, but clearly when you look at something like mass incarceration or police brutality in that sense, males poor males generally, but poor black males especially, uh, seem to be some of the greatest victims proportionally, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think trying to come up with new theories, because uh, this is groundbreaking stuff in the sense that people are not talking about it. They're not trying to explain uh, black male vulnerability or 
uh, the sexual vulnerability of, or vulnerability of black men, uh, then I think that these new theories are going to have to, you know, take some time to, to disseminate through the academy and be challenged and debated, and hopefully they'll take hold. Hmm. Wow. Uh, later, later on, a little bit further down uh, in the report, uh, it states, uh, importantly, it must be noted that whites actually lose out because they miss opportunities professionally, educationally, interpersonally that might be accrued by encouraging the diverse experiences and intellectual contributions black males can offer the campus community, uh, mm -hmm. saying whites uh, that they lose out when black males experience this battle fatigue where they're experiencing white supremacy in various forms where they do not feel like they are a valid, accepted member of the academic community or you're just some you know, dumb jock. You're not here because yeah. you don't have anything uh, in terms of your ability to function in a classroom environment. Maybe you can run around on the field or the court, but certainly you're no, you're no scholar athlete uh, if you're a black person. Uh, and just to know, I, I've heard this before where people kind of present the same argument in terms of talking about what they call integrated classrooms and saying that whites miss out when you don't have a more diverse uh, academic environment if, if non-white students are excluded completely. Uh, and I just, at least for me, um, I think that this notion of whites missing out somehow if uh, because of the practice of racism, because black people are excluded or are, are not thought of uh, as being scholars, not thought of with their full, their humanity intact, I think it obscures whites are not interested in receiving black people in their full humanity. Whites are committed irredeemably, so I think we talked about that on the program, irredeemably committed to racism, white supremacy, I think. In their mind, from their perspective, they would be losing out if black people were included in that academic environment. If we did think, yes, you're a scholar, and I'm not surprised that you got a perfect score on this test because I know black people can be brilliant. That's great. I, I, just, I just think that whole notion of whites are missing out, too, because of racism, I think that leads right back into somehow this notion that white people can be redeemed, or if they just get the correct information, they'll stop doing this, and they'll realize that we can all do a great job in this together. What, what would your response right. to that be? Yeah, yeah. Often I think, often I think those fouls... You know, right? I mean, I think in this case it's kind of a both end, right? So it's 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 true in the sense that black people who are putting themselves in this college situation are being excluded because of racism, and hence they're being marginalized and their voices are not being heard, right? So in a world where you have the black person that creates the idea that they're going to go to college, they're going to be socially mobile, then that has that effect. White people don't benefit, they feel excluded, they disengage, they experience racial battle fatigue, and then you have black male dropouts, X, Y, Z. On the other hand, I also think you're correct, right, that part of the assumption behind that is that white people will listen, that this will enhance their perspective, but if we take the view, like a Derek Bell view, that racism is permanent, or that white people are irredeemably racist in the sense they're at some point, you know, as I said with the whole white ignorance thing, they never seem to mistake on the cell where they divest themselves of any kind of power, <laughs> right, despite how ignorant they are. You know, if we know that that's not the dynamic, then, you know, you're also right, that, that you're, going, you're not going to get... There's not going to be a world possible where these people are fundamentally integrated in the systems of knowledge or the structures of knowledge in a way that we would see, we would deem anywhere close to equality, right? Um, but again, I think that, they, you know, this is the tones of the study, that, you know, as, as educators, as sociologists, um, there's a, they start with different assumptions. They start with different problems. And, you know, I mean, I don't think anything's wrong with that, but at the same time, as a political theorist, you know, uh, and I start with a very different assumption, right, about how society ultimately forecloses the ability of black people to ever be recognized uh, as human beings precisely because of the kind of uh, schema that white people have enforced globally. And I don't think that that's really a new argument. That's something that Du Bois closes with in 45 and something that he continues well into the 19, early 1960s before his death. So I think the question we have to ask ourselves uh, in both veins is, is are we writing for black people so that they understand these things, or are we writing to reform white people? I think if it's going to be the latter, then we're going to be sorely disappointed, as every other generation of intellectuals has been from the 19th century forward. Um, but if we're writing to actually describe black life, if we're actually writing to describe the kinds of social phenomena and ideological uh, motivations that affect black people, you know, then I think there's a much wider rubric for how we you know, discuss these kinds of findings. Hmm. Uh, 
There was a uh, report in the Washington Post uh, just within the last month. Uh, Walter Kimbrough, he's the president at uh, Dillard University, uh, which is the HBCU in your native Louisiana, uh, and he was talking about the surge in enrollment uh, at uh, HBCUs. Uh, they call, I think they titled it the Missouri Effect because of the protests that happened at the University of Missouri uh, last year. The football team got involved and all of that, but in his uh, open letter, he was saying, Mr. Kimbrough, that, I'm paraphrasing, that black students, black people in general, that we need to have realistic expectations and that at these historically white institutions that they are not going to make major adaptations to accommodate black students, that that's not what they're there for, no, that, that, that ignores the history and that if we really, if, as black scholars, if we really are not pleased with these environments, then we should maybe take a second look at black institutions. Uh, and just what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? No, I think that's, I mean, that's just obviously true. <laughs> I mean, like, there's not really, a, there's not a way to really disagree with that statement, you know. I mean, because if you think about it, most, most of these institutions that are predominantly white, like the PWIs, you know, they have better resources than HBCUs. They're practically exclusively white in terms of their faculty. They're majority white in terms of their student, pop, student body. So, you know, I look at Texas A&M. There's like 4% black faculty here. And, I mean, I mean I'm sure those numbers cheat in the sense that they're, they're counting um, international people as well. So when you're looking at that, you know, and you look at the number of black students, which I think barely – top 2,000, it may be like 21 or 2,200, you know, I mean, that's not diversity, right? I mean, that's, you know, that's, these people are pretty much self-segregated. When they do participate, like they had the Prairie View A&M game, you had all kind of racial instances have. You know, like people, white people have accepted racism as a normal part of American society. What white people don't like is when black people point out that they're racist, right? Yeah. That's the issue. Right? I mean, we can't. We it, it seems it seems futile to keep arguing about whether or not white people are racist. That's a fact. It seems to be futile to argue whether or not American society is structured based on this idea of racism. So, if you take those two things as a starting place, then there's not really an argument for why white people would continue to support institutions that are somehow anti-racist. So, it would follow that if they're supporting these public institutions that are predominantly white colleges, that those two have to be racist to some extent, either in the fact that they're producing people to fit within a racist society, or they're part of the racist society and structured by the racism. Like neither, neither, none of those things seem to be beyond the realm of possibility or actuality. So I think that when you have comments like, you know, like the President Diller made, then you have to say, okay, well, look, if we know that's the fact, are HBCUs radicalizing and taking that black population? See, that's the conversation I would have with the HBCU curricula or the HBCU professors, the HBCU trustees, is that if you see this huge moment of, you know, dis you know, of, of distress and, you know, black radicalization, do you take those black radicals in and you radicalize them further and show them how to organize, or do you try to make them respectable? Because the at-large history of HBCUs have been more towards respectability and practicality rather than actual anti-establishment radicality. You know, so, I mean, I think that that would be an interesting question that we should start debating if that is, in fact, the direction that many black students start taking in relationship to HBCUs. And then there's the funding issue, right, the question of whether or not black, black institutions could actually take on this surge that's coming. It's going to bring more money in, but are these institutions able to handle uh, the surge of black students that are leaving PWIs? Right? And then how does the society react, right? You know, I mean, these are just very tense moments, and the kinds of things that we occupy ourselves with, like Nate Parker, um, doesn't answer the larger questions of how black people are going to coexist and live within a society that's fundamentally geared against them. And it's going to be interesting to see how long intersectionality and these other ideas hold up, given that you're having this huge surge of student protests in the 21st century and some of the empirical realities that are kind of notching away at the idea of male privilege because you see a huge, you know, they're just, it's so visible that black men are just killed, you know, so much more than their female counterpart. So I'm just, you know, it's, and, and these are poor working class males by and large. So I mean, you know, theory theory is coming up, you know, it's coming up pretty hard against reality, and I'm just, I'm very curious to see which one wins out. Mm. Context of white supremacy, Dr. Tommy J. Curry. Uh, if folks have questions uh, you would like to ask Dr. Curry, uh, feel free. The number to dial six four one seven one five three six. 
5649540. The code is 564943pound. Uh, our caller in Canada, uh, if you had a question for Dr. Curry, uh, you should be with us. Did you have a question? Go ahead, sir. Oh, hey, Gus. Um, oh, it's been a while. Um, hello, Dr. Curry. Okay, I have sir. three questions. Okay, the first question in regard to this, this sort of related to this toxic masculinity stuff I see a lot of is Hotep Twitter. Mm -hmm. So there was a post from a Black Lives Matter Toronto person, but it's something that I see that happens in the U.S. as well, about Hotep Twitter, why it must go. Now, is this obsession with Hotep Twitter, because as you said, there's a lot of, this is very academic based, the criticism of it. Is it due to folks coming from other fields and using those ideas to study black people as opposed to actually developing ideas and theories out of our, our actual particularities and the, our particularities in terms of history, culture, sociology, et cetera? Well, I, th I, mean, I think that's certainly part of it. I think Hotel Twitter really is a pop culture articulation of some of the arguments of intersectional visibility that is used to demonize any group that is both non or anti feminist, pro black or nationalistic, or pro black male. Um, I've seen it deployed against those three groups more off, most often. Um, the problem with that is that I don't know what it means. I don't, I mean, given, you know, <laughs> Given the comedic definition of of hotep or, or is is actual use, I don't see why that how that fits. But if it's meant to be this kind of pseudo intellectual attack against black nationalism, then again, what we're talking about are pop cultural tropes, right? The idea that black nationalism is only concerned with black men, which is historically false. The idea that black men constantly take the lead in political organization, which seems to go against practically most of the history that we have of the Jim Crow South, especially the work of Glenda Gilmore. Um, you know, it just doesn't fit. So, I, you know, again, I think that these are kind of the popular reactions, the, the allergies, so to speak, that people use to just offhand dismiss things that they don't want to hear. Um, the funny thing about social media is that most of the information exchange there is incredibly insular in the sense that every, it's kind of a group thing. So Hotep Twitter is one of the things that people use to dismiss people they don't want to hear. And I think, I think I was on there once or twice and people, someone called me Hotep, you know, because I was speaking about the victimization of black men in relationship to the victimization of black women, um, for the last two or three years. I think I was providing data from, you know, the, the Washington Post from it was the Guardian site. And I said, well, listen, if, if, if the presentation of facts makes you Hotep, Tip, that means that anybody who tries to address the arguments about black male vulnerability are automatically locked outside of the conversation when you're claiming that your movement is primarily geared towards addressing police killings. You know, so I don't. Again, I don't. I don't understand the, the motivations, but you know, these things are irrational. And like I said, there never needs to really be a deep or substantive argument for why it happens. It's just, you know, it's mass think. You know, a bunch of people think that it's the it's the case. You know, if you're a black male, you're talking about black male victimization. You got to be hotep, so you dismiss women or allegedly abusive. You know, it's, it's all fiction. It's just made up, but that's what sticks because a lot of people believe it. Okay, now thank you for the answer. Now for my next question, with the Nate Parker thing, one of the things I noticed was that I guess it was, I don't know if it was the first or the second response he made when the allegations got popular, and I guess I heard a lot of, I, the argument was that he sounds like a rapist, like it sounds like oh, yeah. a hidden confession. So th does this mean because, does it also, one of the things I was wondering, does it suggest that we don't even have an adequate language or discourse for understanding the type of trauma victims of false accusations deal with and then having that case brought up 17 years later how could it affect him if if, if we're obviously I'm taking the assumption that it might that he was innocent couldn't we right. look at that as well? no absolutely I mean we need we need um, you know the exoneration literature talks about this a little bit right that you know of all the exonerations in the from the Innocence Project, black men are like 62-ish, 65% of those people exonerated for either murder or rape. So 
yes, false accusations, you know, have a very, very powerful effect. And false convictions, you know, or of convictions that only turn out to be false, um, have an even greater impact because most of the people that are black men that are put away for rape don't get exonerated for at least 10 to 20 years. It's not like they go in one year and the next year they're out. This is a long process. It usually takes about a decade or more. So to suggest even in the slightest, that the consequences of a false accusation are to be taken lightly uh, is just, again, it's a denial of the facts and it's a denial of the victimization of black males. Um, I don't think the black community, especially the black academic community, really wants to study rape. I mean, outside of, you know, things that are coming out of English or kind of like popular culture, you don't really have a serious investigation of rape. And when you look in the criminology literature, um, you see it talked about, but you don't see it talked about with a specific eye to race in relationship to, like, you know, exoneration and things like that. So we need a complete reformulation of how we want to study black male vulnerability in relationship to false accusations, rape, and, and this is the other part, how not all of these crimes are interracial. There seems to be a silence on the issue that some of the false accusations of rape, and you can think of the most, you know, I mean, I guess the most the case that comes to mind most readily is Brian Banks, where the accuser was a black woman and she was able to get, I think it was like a, almost a million dollars or a few hundred thousand dollars um, by falsely accusing a black man. Like, these are very real issues that happen to black men um, that we don't want to take seriously because we, you know, with the Title IX culture of yes means yes, you know, people want to say, well, we always believe the victims, but there is a kind of an empirical side to that. If you believe the victims and then it comes out that they're wrong, then what happens to the alleged victim? Because now they become a perpetrator. They've ruined someone's life or they've cost somebody their career or they forced somebody to commit suicide because of depression abuse they found, you know, in prison or some Somebody contracted AIDS because they were sent to a prison as a young boy and raped, and they're dying. Like, all these are actual consequences that exist within the prison literature and the prison rape literature especially that shows that young black men that go into jail ha often are victimized. You know, so this is not something that we should be taking lightly. But because they're males, and specifically because they're black males, and society has very little empathy for that group or for the group that, that they belong to, um, these kinds of violences and sexual mistreatments uh, are not taken seriously. So, no, I think it's a very very grave issue, and I think that is something we need to do better on. Oh, yeah, I had a, I forgot my third question, Gus. It's okay. You can go on to the next person. Thank you, Dr. Curry. No, thank you, sir. Wow, I appreciate it. Good to hear from you, sir. Uh, caller, you're on the vote line. Did you have a question for Dr. Curry? You should be with us. Hello? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, because my computer is acting funny. Good evening. Thank you so much for taking my call. Hopefully, everyone's having a good evening. Um, um, I have a question. Well, of course, that's why I called in the... Um, on Friday, well, let me start. I'm a new, I'm a new member at... New employ, I'm newly employed at a university. And I don't. I guess you know, at most universities, you have to watch like the sexual harassment video or whatever to make sure you're, you're in compliance, things like that. So watching the video, there's a young white woman. She's had too much to drink at a party or something, so that's her situation. There's a looks like a white or Latino man. He could be stalked by a woman. They never show her, and then they show Tim. Tim is a black man, kind of looks like the Henry Simmons guy from NYPD Blue. So I'm like, oh, okay. I guess they really want us to watch the video because he's nice looking. So they show, they show him, and then they say he has a partner. And his situation is intimate violence or domestic violence. Then his, his little scenario gets a little bit more violent because here comes his partner who is Caucasian. This is in the video. This, I mean, this is in the video. And his partner is hurt. You can see he's visibly hurting him. So at first, I was kind of upset. I'm like, why does he have to be gay, this, and the other? Is that a good thing? Because it does show that black men can be subject to domestic violence, that we need to really pay attention to that. Not that I wouldn't because I'm a black person, but that more people need to pay attention to that. Well, I mean, I mean, yeah. Thank but you. It's, it's kind of one of those things, right? Like, I mean, yes, it's good to show that black men hello? can be victim. Yes, hello? Hello? Yes, can you hear me? I don't think she can hear me. Um, 
But to answer your question, yes, I think it's good that we show that black men can be victims of domestic violence. Um, um, I think that part of the problem is that we don't see black men within the natural uh, circumstances of domestic violence, which is usually based in poverty, uh, which is usually deal, dealing with unemployment, some kind of substance or drug abuse issue. I think all those things kind of build um, into the problems of domestic violence and bidirectionality in our communities. So, yes, it's, it's helpful, but it doesn't really explain the fundamental condition of domestic violence or uh, intimate partner homicide in the black community specifically. Uh, it looks like she might have uh, disconnected, uh, and I think there, there might have been a delay as well, but I hope that answered uh, her question. Uh, Ma'am, if that did not answer your question, uh, if you needed some clarification, uh, if you just dial back in, put your hand up, I'll see. I'll recognize your line, and we'll, uh, we'll see if Dr. Curry can add anything if need be. Uh, the caller at uh, last four digits, 1791. 1791. Did you have a question for Dr. Curry? You should be with us. Yes, hi. This is Akia. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, um, hi, Dr. Curry. It's good to finally talk to you. It's been a minute. <laughs> um, so, I, obviously, you know, I follow your work. I'm very thankful for your work. But one of the questions I wanted to ask, I'm, I'm in D.C. now. I was actually at a meeting earlier um, with the Open Society Foundation around um, school to prison pipeline. And one of the things that I'm finding that's really, really challenging when I'm in these spaces now is really continuing to elevate what's happening to black boys um, in schools and what's happening, obviously, just in the world. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware, but there's another video of uh, a black man being killed by the cops in Oklahoma, Terrence yeah, Presser. Um, and, and so it's, it's, um, it's becoming just too much, and then all the politics is about um, you know, disability rights or, you know, black women and girls, which I think both of those are extremely important. But when I look at what's happening right on the ground in the communities, when I look at the data in Ohio, in Dayton Public Schools, and even nationally, you know, black boys continue to be the ones that are most impacted um, by school to prison pipeline policies and over policing, and so one of the things that um, I wanted to see if you know your work or you know if there's anybody else, is there a way to um, get the work that you're doing on um, you know anti-black male misandry and all this other stuff? Is there a way to get that work included in these different spaces, much how Kimberly Crenshaw has done? Because everybody knows her name at that table. Like every, I mean, she's in everything now, and intersectionality is like this catch-all. And you know, I'm sure I'm a whole step. Nobody's called me that to my face, but I'm I'm constantly finding myself, you know, kind of pushing back and having to go back to the data to point people, like you know, not to just ignore what's happening to black boys. Yeah, I mean that's yeah, I mean that's a constant problem. I mean, the same thing happens in the academy. You know, I mean, you, you have, it's, it's so crazy in the university that you have even white people using intersectionality to justify their racist practices, right? Like, we shouldn't hire more black men because black men are privileged over black women, so should we should hire black women, right? You know, there's, there's all kind of, like I say, these, they're analytic calculus that, that justifies whatever will white people have, you know, of the day. Um, I don't know. I mean, the thing is, is that, you know, Crenshaw's work came about during a period of time where, you know, you had this kind of explosion of black feminist thought in the United States Academy, and it caught on. Uh, different people started writing on it, and it's it's kind of the phrase, right? I mean, they write articles now about how energy Cooper was an intersectionality theorist, which is kind of crazy given the world of ethnology, but nonetheless, you know, it's the argument that some people make. Um, you know, I mean, I think these things take time, and it, it requires a public and activists who want to utilize the work um, to to kind of do it. I mean, it's a battle that I fight within the academy uh, because, like, when you when you actually look at the data that many people use to support the argument for intersectionality, uh, is just highly selective, right? Like when they pick only you know female victims of domestic abuse, and they constantly overlook male victims. I mean, one of the problems with Crenshaw's article, for instance, um, when she's talking about domestic abuse. Uh, and political versus structural intersectionality is that she bases all her data on the same report that showed that black men were being killed at the same. Like she bases off that uh, that 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 FBI supplement data 
that Strauss did in 75. And it shows, you know, Strauss is very clear that his data during, you know, for that survey showed that women are beating men just as much as men are beating women. Because, you know, he doesn't think that it's an asymmetrical problem. He thinks it's symmetrical. So there's a kind of selectivity on the basis of how we read intersectionality theory um, that doesn't really fit with reality. And even when um, Crenshaw recently published a piece on intersectional visibility, where she was talking about the attention that black men get from prisons and police death, she never negated the fact that black men are killed more. But again, it's the argument of interpretation that we just shouldn't focus on them as much. And I don't know what that I don't know what that does. Because again, you wouldn't make the same argument about things like domestic abuse or rape. So you just you're just kind of picking the violence of the day. You're saying that well, these people are so overwhelmingly the victims that they get all the attention and all the recognition. But then the recognition and attention doesn't stop the death or the violence. So I don't know what you're arguing about, except you just don't want to really talk about black men's victims being greater victims of violence than women. Um, I don't know what it amounts to. I don't know the implication of intersectional visibility. So I think it's going to take some time for people to get used to people criticizing intersectionality on a main as a mainstay. Um, right. It's going to take some time for people to get used to people making these kinds of arguments against intersectionality theory. Um, and I think that we, one of the problems that we have is this. Intersectionality has generally been able to utilize all the arguments against it as part of the theory. So when people like you know, Peter Kwan or Darren Hutchinson made arguments about multidimensionality, they were like, oh, well, that's what intersectionality does. Now you're having criticisms that are growing on the basis of anti-black misandry, black male vulnerability, you know, like William A. Smith's work on racial battle fatigue and misandric microaggressions, and that stuff is fundamentally incompatible with intersectionality theory because it's saying that the way you read the male category is just fundamentally false, right? So is those those are much more serious challenges, I think, to the theory uh, in and of itself, which is why you have these other kinds of rationalizations involved. Yeah. Well, I mean, I always, um, you know, use your work when I'm in these spaces, when, and when I'm in these certain spaces, but most folks are pretty, like, I mean, they're pretty intellectually lazy, and then if we're honest, if funding is attached to it, people are not going to be, um, you know, into the whole struggling around this political idea. People just kind of go along with it. But, you know, I'm like one of the few people who sit in the room and, like, challenge it. And I, I basically challenge it on the basis of being a mother of a black boy who has experienced this. And so people don't usually, like, come at me as hard. And I think, you know, because you can't take my experience away from me. Like, how do you explain, you know, for example, in the state of Ohio, 2014-2015 um, school year, 100% of all preschoolers that were expelled from school were black, but 85% of them were black males. I said that in the room today. And then even after that, people were still talking about focusing on black girls. And and you're right, I don't get it. And so I continue have to be like, well, how do you focus on the 15% but 85% of them are black, are black males? That are, I mean, these are three- to five-year-olds, you know, right. so it's not even – I mean, you see what I'm saying? It's like – I. It's so frustrating, you know, and I feel like our our children, because these people, you know, have their salaries and everything, and nine times ten, their kids are going to be fine, but they have no connection to the grassroots. And the only reason why I'm in the space is because I'm connected to people, how I'm, I'm and I'm able to be in the space that are very grassroots. I mean, my, I'm definitely not a part of these big national organizations where they have you know six figure salaries to pontificate about this stuff. Like I live this. The parents I organize with, I live this. And so um, that's just the frustrating part. But I mean, I'll continue to do my part, and please continue to share all of your work. Um, I thank you for making it public that, you know, we have access to it as grassroots folks trying to organize and, and push in these different spaces. I just really wanted to lift you up and, and say thank you. So no, I, appreciate I appreciate it, it ma'am. I mean, look, this is going to be a battle, right? I mean, because there's been a dominance of a particular type of black feminist historiography and politics that really does try to erase the peculiar victimizations of black men and boys. So, you know, like most like most paradigm shifts, this is going to be a fight, and people are going to get pushed to the margins, and people are going to attack, you know, my character, my work, as well as other scholars who are doing this same kind of work. 
So I think, again, it's going to take time. You know, this is why institutions give people tenure so they can say what they want. Um, but you're right. I mean, it doesn't – it doesn't make sense. There was actually a position paper that was put out by the Institute for the Study of Black Males where they were responding to Paul Butler's piece where he was saying that, you know, helping black males is patriarchal. He's like, listen, you, you're saying that if we help the people who are at the greatest need, that's patriarchy. But you don't have an explanation for why these people have the greatest need within patriarchy. If men are all powerful and black men don't have that power, you still say they're patriarchal. But when they do worse than black women, you have absolutely no response. You have no way to remedy it. Right? So when black men are incarcerated more, when black men are killed more, when black boys don't matriculate as much, you say, I will. Right? Mm-hmm. You know, nobody's holding feminist feet to the fire saying, well, listen, if you're doing gender analysis, why aren't you focusing on men? That's not an argument in the United States. It's an argument in Australia. Yeah. It's an argument in Europe. Right? But it's not an argument in the United States. So there's a very real intellectual neglect of the victimization of black boys because the overarching idea that is now disseminated throughout the culture and the public is patriarchy means all male dominance. And mm-hmm. because there's these hyper-masculine theories of black men and boys where black men and boys are thought to be violent, we even have arguments talking about, you know, I, I, was, looking, I was on somebody's page today, and they're like, well, black women don't kill black men. I'm like, what data are you looking at? Right, like what? I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, what are you talking about? Like, black men are out of any racial group. Black men are most at risk marrying or being in relations with black women in terms of intimate partner violence. Right, like it's just untrue, and it's not because they're black women. Right, it's not because black women are fundamentally evil or violent. It's because they're in an economic situation and dealing with certain exactly. stressors that facilitate violence. The same way that they'll live in the same neighborhoods that facilitate homicide and facilitate gun violence and facilitate crime, right? People act like, you know, so so that's the narrowness, right? Like you'll say black men are violent, but then you look at the black men in their neighborhoods and you'll find black women in those neighborhoods are violent too. The issue isn't the gender as the causality of the violence. The issue is the conditions that the people are in. So then these bourgeois black people take theories because they're, and you know, in my book I say this is gender theory racially profiles black men. They'll racially profile black men and say, ah, oh, look at all the violence they commit, and they won't do any other analysis of the economic political situation or the issue of substance abuse or the history of trauma, which is what we're looking at in, um, you know, in an article of female perpetrated rape, uh, statutory rape of, of, my, of black male minors. Right, all these things matter because if you rape a boy when he's five or six or seven or he has an early sexual experience with an older woman, these things facilitate things like violence, depression, anxiety, etc. If you neglect a child because he's unwanted in foster care and he's homeless, etc., that's going to cause a maladjustment to society. And guess what? It's a partner violence. If he grows up on the streets, if he grows up without any opportunities, if he starts in the middle class but has downward mobility because he can't get a job, guess what? Unemployment causes violence. You see, like these are all environmental factors that have the same yeah. correlations to intimate partner violence and societal violence that we talk about with masculinity. But because people don't read any farther than bell hooks, suddenly masculinity becomes the only thing they talk about instead of all the situations, cultural contexts, and traumas that black men endure within these different situations. And at that point, that's when I say that this stuff is intellectually dishonest because it asks people, especially activists in communities, to adopt their bourgeois gender frame oh, when these people come from environments that are you know criminalized that are having public schools that are being underserved and underfunded and they can see that black boys aren't violent but you keep you keep you keep marginalizing them to such an extent that when they disengage they're socialized by entities that only produce violence you know uh, thank you for your uh, commentary thank you. Uh, for sure thank you mm-hmm. no thank you thank you ma'am uh, the caller at 2812, 2812, did you have a uh, Yes, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, Dr. Question Curry. for Dr. Curry. You should be with us. Yeah, can you hear me? Caller, yes. last four digits. Yes, sir. All right, uh, good deal. Um, uh, uh, quick question for you, Dr. Curry. Um, I have watched, um, I've just been trying to try to watch uh, more um constructive pieces of entertainment and things of that nature on television. And, and um, one thing that uh, now that I'm a little bit less confused that I realize is that everything that I see in media and even just anywhere is just a lot of black dysfunction. And um, the reason why I'm just bringing that out is that um, there's a new show on OWN, on the OWN Network, which is Oprah, and it's called Clean Sugar. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Um, but uh, the first five minutes of that show, 
was a dark-skinned black male robbing a liquor store um, and leaving his son on a bench. Uh, the next scene was a black female in an interracial relationship with a married white man. And then the next scene, a couple of scenes later in the show, was about a basketball player who all of a sudden got caught raping his wife. And uh, not raping his wife, but raping another female um, that turned out to be an escort. My point in saying all that is one of Oprah's, and it just seems like that's her network, and I'm not saying anything condescending against her, it's a lot of themes of just black, specifically black male dysfunction. And it almost seems like the black females that are getting, you know, called successes are literally almost just leaving these same black males who are their sons, who are their fathers, and who are sometimes their husbands just left out to dry. Um, do you do you think there's ever a point, and I don't want to say um, that they would give it up, but do you think there's ever a point to where I know white supremacy is not going to stop compensating these females for making this uh, for making this kind of content, but what specifically can we can we do in terms of just the content because everything is just black dysfunction? Can, can you just talk about that a little bit? Well, I think there's yeah, I think there's a few things. Um, one, no, I don't think they're going to give it up. Not in the sense that this is a black woman problem, but I think this is a black female class problem, right? Um, when you look at where some of these ideas are coming from, they reflect an ideology that's largely taken from upper mobile, educated black women. Um, that's generally the population that um, that endorse certain notions of this kind of feminist identity politics. So that's the first thing. The second thing is when you look at the popularity or the resonance that that has within black communities, um, it's usually, it, you know, it doesn't resonate with poor black communities, especially poor southern black communities as well. Uh, so that's the first thing, you know, we kind of have to isolate the regions. The second thing is, you know, I think black men need a better public voice, right? We have very few venues where black males can actually express disdain or critique of gender notions um, in the United States that are not pathologized as hypermasculine or apologetic for violence against women. So there needs to be a very real discussion, public forum, um, backing. Uh, it'd be nice if someone like Atlanta Black Star or something did a series on black males by black male academics, you know, that would get broader readership about some of these issues and misconceptions about black men. Uh, the third thing is I think that we need, you know, the same way that you see this huge mobilization of, you know, black women, both professionals and, you know, viewers of these shows uh, when they have something that they disagree with. I think black men have to do the same thing. You know, in a world where black men are being exterminated, where black men are being incarcerated at such a disproportionate rate, I don't necessarily think the idea is to attack, you know, black women per se, but it is to problematize the images that they're that they're offering. You know, the the the, the biggest irony of this is this is that um, you know part of Connell's theory of hegemonic masculinity, you know, toxic masculinity, is that in order for toxic masculinity to become an aspirational idea within a white supremacist society, or you know, she talks about it as a capitalist, uh, modern capitalist society, is that you have to have buy-in from women, and she says that the buy-in that you have from women, we call that emphasized femininity. Right, because what women do is they buy into patriarchy, but then they become kind of the handmaidens and enablers of patriarchy. And I think that sometimes when you see these images and these narratives that come from especially successful um, economically mobile black women, you what you're seeing there is an example of emphasized femininity. You're seeing them buy into the larger ruling class notion of black males uh, because it puts them closer to the men of the dominant ruling class, which are white men, and those are the men that they desire sometimes because of the class, uh, the proximity of class. So, you know, I think that that's why you get this kind of broad-scale acceptance and narration of uh, black men as rapists, black men as pathological, and, uh, you know, black men as disposable. Uh, Gus, can I ask one more question? Sure. Oh, okay. Um, and my next question was, um, I just wanted to get your quick take on it, was in reference to the so-called black communities, um, just places where a lot of black people live, there's been an overwhelming notion, um, I'd like to call it escapism, mm -hmm. where everyone is trying to make it out the hood. Well, you know, the majority of people that I know, including myself, um, when we leave these particular neighborhoods, if we're not leaving... <laughs> if we're not leaving any sort of generational wealth or building some sort of economic base, it almost seems like we're literally handicapping these kids. And it's like 
every kid has to start over, yeah. every single one, yeah. all the time. And even though the, with the push for academics, I went for HBCU, and I went to an HBCU, and my parents did as well, you know, that neighborhood that I grew up in, Jamaica, Queens, has not changed for 50 years. Yeah. It's the exact same thing. Um, what different solutions do you have, obviously, other than building an economic base, but can you talk a little bit about that um, in reference to just how, I don't know if we've done a disservice, but I understand the academic point and getting degrees, but every kid there is starting from the bottom, even with no, the so even even with the with the source of, of a lot of, I don't want to call it black wealth because we're still at the bottom, but with monetary, but every single kid in those communities is starting over, and I just don't know how we can fix that. No, I mean, I think that's actually one of the problems, you know. I mean, I talk about white supremacy, but for me, white supremacy is an analytic by which we get to things like, you know, um, economic deprivation, relative deprivation, uh, you know, rich-poor gaps, you know, downward mobility. You know, my work talks about all that, you know, as well. So you're you're right. There is not a intergenerational transfer of property or wealth in the black community. So the effect of that is because we have to start over, one of the biggest – means that you tell lower class people of of mobilizing through classes is education. So because black people are not any owners of, you know, the means of production, so to speak, you know, we we try to become extremely efficient workers, and those of us who can uh, try to escape the hood in that way. Um, How do we change that? Unfortunately, in a capitalist society, you can't, unless you want to disrupt the very structures and organization of society, which is why I argue that Black Lives Matter and these other social movements that are taking advantage of the disdain that many black students have on college campuses are doing a disservice both to themselves and the movement because the black people that you're talking about that are the basis of the foundation and population of your movement are aspiring black middle class people. They're in college precisely so that they can ascend into the middle class as efficient and skillful workers. That doesn't bode well for a movement that allegedly wants to reorganize the way that society runs because after four years, those people now have an incentive to become part of the system. Now, they want, may want incremental change within it, but that doesn't mean they're going to fundamentally cha- you know, champion right. the redistribution right. of wealth to the lower classes. So that's just a, that's just a, narrow, you know, a narrow sphere. Um, I think the closest thing you had is at the beginning of uh, Occupy, which was talking about the redistribution of right uh, of wealth, um, specifically you know specific investment zones within black communities. At one point, I think there was even a conversation about a black owned currency. Those types of things could change, right? Because you're keeping money within the communities. But at large, there's nothing that people can do within one or two generations that are going to fundamentally restructure the way that wealth is distributed and resources are given to these communities within these urban zones. They're they're created just for that purpose. All right, I appreciate it. Thanks, Gus. Thanks, Dr. Kirk. No problem. Our uh, retired firefighter in Florida, did you have a question for Dr. Curry? You should be with us. Uh, greetings, everyone. <clears throat> uh, two questions. Uh, well, first, I, I probably need to state, uh, is there a particular topic or is it uh, open for any any topic? You ask any question you want, sir. Uh, what was that, Dr. Curry? That's it. No, ask it. Ask away. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. Uh, first, first uh, topic: Colin Kaepernick. Uh, with the National Football League, uh, who I think is a, a, an organization that's very uh, image conscious, and also is headed primarily by uh, wealthy, powerful white males. Uh, what do you think is going to be the conclusion with uh, Colin Kaepernick and uh, other uh, members of the National Football League who uh, are not standing up and doing what they want them to do for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance and the National Anthem? No, I mean, I think it's I think it's a transition moment. You know, I think it's a question of whether or not players seek to unionize and organize against a league of you know white male managers that seek to own their bodies and their political allegiances, right? I mean, you see, that's what I'm saying. Like, there's there's a lot of potentiality in this moment that we're in. The problem is, is that we don't have a socialized or organized conscience of racial radicality. We're still living off of tropes of the civil rights movement, right? So this is a very interesting place about whether or not 
other football players are going to say, no, just because we're employed by the NFL, we don't have to reflect its political uh, sentiments about this kind of issue. And if players do that and the league responds negatively, there's a question, well, then how do the players organize? Do they form their own unions, their own organizations that allow them to have separate political beliefs outside of that of their employer? And, 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 and football players are very visible entities, right? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's a PR nightmare for the NFL. You know, but I've seen that some more teams and coaches are starting to do so. You have high school players that are doing so. You have women athletes doing so, right? So again, this is part. Again, this is you know, you know, we 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 like to joke. You know, we we look at history as this moment where like, you know, people woke up and there was the Black Panthers, right? But this is how this stuff starts. Like it's a it's a progressive consciousness and social building and it's infusing and defusing different dissents and anger. Right, and the, you know that's what I'm saying. With my criticism, of Black Lives Matter has always been it's too quickly diffusing the dissent and trying to limit it, right? Because you have all this anger and all this potential for us changing things, and they're like, well, if you're if you're you know if you're black and male, if you're poor, if you're you know prone to violence, then you can't be part of an organization. It's like, yeah, that's not exactly how social movements work, right? Social movements take all that in and they guide it towards certain purposes. This this this, you know, organization has been pretty exclusive in terms of what it's, you know, of announcing up front what it will and won't do. And I think that that's, of course, a mistake. So I think what you see with Colin is an individual act that's spreading and black athletes who are the money makers for these organizations now pose an economic threat uh, to majority white owned uh, enterprise. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question and last question that I have is the, uh, the vote. Uh, specifically at this point in time, the, the more popular presidential vote. Uh, I wouldn't tell anybody not to vote personally uh, because where I look at it, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's not going to uh, solve the problem of racist white supremacy, but uh, by voting uh, you may can get uh, in this prison that's called uh, white supremacy, that I call white supremacy, uh, that you can get uh, better drapes in the sale, you can get uh, perhaps uh, a different, air, a better air condition or whatever, you know, that sort of thing. But uh, something about me still can't put pen to paper for either of the two candidates. Uh, I've even heard the uh, the uh, well used uh, uh, euphorism uh, lesser of two evils. Uh, can you can you can you uh, articulate uh, to your understanding of the uh, uh, presidential vote and and also about the uh, the uh, statement lesser of two evils? Well, yeah, I don't know. If in this case, it is a lesser of two evils. It just seems to be two evils, <laughs> <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, right. You know, and I think I mean you know this is the problem. This is the problem with a two party system, right? You know, you know. <sighs> There is no answer, right? I mean, unless you're going to vote third party because you want to exercise the right to vote and you think that that's important and you don't want to cast it for them, the reality of the situation is that either Trump or either Hillary Clinton is going to be president. Most likely it's going to be Hillary Clinton because she's carrying a lot of the moderate, you know, the same people that Obama carried, which were the moderate, educated whites, specifically white women, she's going to carry them too, despite the fact that she's a carceral feminist and an imperialist. So given that reality, I think that black men especially. I think poor black women are going to be hurt uh, with her policies. Um, but I think upper and middle class black women are going to be extremely helped by her policies. But black men generally are going to be disadvantaged. So it's going to be a traumatic eight years um, under this kind of president. But I think that what you're, going to, what you're going to see at the end of it is kind of maybe a new analysis or hopefully, for God's sakes, a new analysis of what um, a kind of Thatcherism, um, to use uh, Stuart Hall's word, uh, looks like in America. Because Hillary Clinton is going to be uh, an imperialist warmonger. Uh, she's going to increase and give legitimacy to carceral feminism that wants to incarcerate racialized men of color 
um, at the to protect the alleged you know safety of white women. Like all this is going to be part of her policies. I mean the the super pre- you know I got upset when people started talking about the super predator because the super predator was not a mythology about all black people. The super predator was an uh, ideology about black men, specifically poor black men in, in urban centers um, becoming being born to poor black women and becoming immediately violent and a threat to white people in a larger society. So given that reality. Um, there's not much that you can hope from a from a Clinton presidency. That being said, does it mean the Clinton presidency is better than a Trump presidency? I'm actually not really sure. Um, I mean, outside of, I mean, it's just bad all the way down. So you know, you get someone who's clearly kind of got some fascistic leanings, um, who's clearly a neoliberal capitalist, a venture capitalist, and completely ignorant and racist. I don't know if that's that that vastly different than a white woman who has the same views but just says nice things in public. Mm-hmm. You know? So, yeah, I don't know, man. I think I think it's going to be a rough eight years, you know. <laughs> yes, I understand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello? Oops. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Do you have a question? Yeah, hi, it's me. I called earlier. I had to disconnect the computer line because it was acting funny. That was me. Yes, ma'am. Um, I called back. <laughs> um, thank you so much for answering that first question. But I guess as a follow-up, I know the last time you were on, I think I talked to you about doing research across disciplines. Yes, ma'am. Do you think because of that video that might be a good idea for, like, HR business? Because I would think, you know, to have some practical results, like you might ask, did what video did you think was realistic and something like that to kind of prove that, yes, this could really happen or show the awareness that people don't think this could happen and kind of teach no, people absolutely. that way? Look, I think I'm I'm all for actually studying black people. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, if, if, if part of the motivation from that video has you to look deeper into black male victimization or if it was, a you know, a picture of black one, like, yes, we should study our own people and we should do so without kind of the bias and predetermined views of some of the theories that are out about gender right now. But so, yeah, if you're motivated to do that, you said it was a same-sex interracial couple, right? Right. Yeah, that's what it was. And like I said, this is shown to everybody who's, I'm, I work in Georgia, everyone who's hired by the University System of Georgia, I guess it varies with school, like your particular document. And I'm guessing it showed all over the country because it looked like it was a third party mm-hmm. who put this video together. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. I would I would do it. I mean, you know, people like uh, Carolyn. Not Carol, area, but, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, Carolyn West's work, you know, suggests that rates of intimate partner violence are the same between heterosexual black couples and same-sex black couples. Um, so, I mean, but, I mean, there is very little literature um, on interracial same-sex black couples. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's certainly a viable research topic, in my, in my opinion. But, of course, you'd have to, like, you know, I mean, I read this stuff because, you know, I write on it in my field. But, you know, I mean, social workers and psychologists have a better view of whether or not the literature base is more developed than I would. Okay, I just thought, it just seemed like something that was practical because of what I thought. No, I like, think, yeah. not, you know, but. Well, you're, okay, you're a new assistant thought, professor, so are you a new assistant professor? Yes, but my field is accounting, but, you know, I'm like okay. you said, like, you know, I'm interested in black people. I like black people. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, look, hook up with somebody in the school of social work, or you know, maybe a psychologist, and say, "Listen, can we work on a joint project together?" You okay. Know? I mean, yeah. I mean, you can certainly look at the, you know, work hours loss or the cost, you know, involved with intimate partner violence for black males in you know various partnerships. So there's all kind of ways that interdisciplinary work can cover the topics you wanted to cover. Okay. Thank you. No, that thank was... you, ma'am. Bye bye. Appreciate that as well. Uh, the caller at 4789. 4789, did you have a question for Dr. Curry? You should be with us. Uh, caller, last four digits, 4789. 4789, did you have a question for Dr. Curry? Mm, not hearing. Uh, I don't know if you're just listening uh, or if you hit your mute button or... Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Sorry. Um, 
Um, well, uh, good. I guess it's good night, Dr. Curry. Uh, I was. I have two questions. Um, my first question is about um, sort of like like the topics that you usually talk about. Um, like if you, let's just say you are a black male and let's just say you have been uh, sexually abused by a black female. Maybe let's just say the black female is in your family or a relative or whatever. And you become older, let's just say. How do you, how do you articulate that to your family, to your, to people around you that, okay, this, there's this black female and she's a predator. Now, I mean, she's older now, but how, how do you articulate that? And because you're like from what you're, you're not going to, are you going to receive the support from your family or society? Like, I feel like a lot of the things that you talk about, it's like as if we're in a, it's like as if you're in a, I don't know, like a box. It's like things happen, but you can't really talk about. Like, so I was just wondering about that dy- that dynamic. Have you seen that? Have you studied that? I've actually yes. I'm, that's that's actually one of my um, main research areas. Um, there's a few things. There's a few things that could happen. There's a few things that could happen. Um, the first is uh, if you if you'd be kind enough to. Uh, you know, correspond correspond with me uh, offline. Um, there's a few different venues uh, and people who are working on this that I think you know would, would be very interested in your story. Um, the second the second thing would be that your your correct your your inclination is correct that there it is very difficult um, to talk about female perpetrated uh, sexual abuse of black males. Um, but one of the ways that, that that the literature says that you know that can help is. Um, both through doing it through you know, therapy, um, possibly bringing along a mediator, um, talking to someone that you trust, um, that 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 you know that you're close to, that would have a higher propensity of believing um, that you were victimized or that the person was victimized at a younger age, and having that support system there uh, in introducing this problem and this information to the family. Um, in terms of social services, these things are are still thin, uh, in the sense that most. Uh, child protective services, you know, assuming this happened uh, when the person was younger, uh, don't report to law enforcement. Um, but now, you know, some therapists are, are actually taking female perpetrated um, domestic abuse or sexual abuse very seriously. Uh, so that's that's one way to deal with kind of the feelings and the anxieties of trauma telling the family. Um, society at large uh, is still very behind on this question. Uh, so in society, for most part, is still in denial that uh, females are, are, are predators um, or do commit rape, statutory rape uh, of, of young males. Uh, and that is a very real obstacle. Um, actually, we're working on a project now that's under review uh, that's talking about uh, six stories uh, from black males who were abused between, I believe, the ages of six and I think the oldest one was 15 or 16. You know, so there is there is work being done on it, but it's not at the point yet where people are taking like serious policy initiatives uh, to address the disparities of services available for uh, you know black male victims of of sexual abuse and violence uh, versus female victims in general. Um, uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, my last question is. Um, how, how how do you i'm having like issues like um talking with uh black females cuz if i'm on a date or something like that with them it's o- there's always a sense that like what you've been talking about that you're in s- sort of like some kind of advantage position like i was on a date and the woman sort of said that you know that black men are sort of like in a privileged position cuz there's fewer of us and that there's more of them so we get sort of like the the pick of the litter and I was like, what? Like, could you? Could you? I was like, what do you mean? So she started talking about the black numbers, how there's fewer of us, and all this. And I was like, how's that a, how's that an advantage? But like, how do you, how do you talk with black females so that you don't offend them because of all this? I guess, I don't know, feminist bombardment, but also try to 
convey to them that you're not in some sort of like privileged position as a black male that's maybe, I don't know, that's doing slightly well or not doing well, but just as a black male that you're not in a privileged position? Well, I mean, I think there's a few things that happen. One is you have to understand why there are fewer black men. <laughs> the reason there are fewer black men is because of the ages of 15 to 34, which are generally are married, you know, marriaging ages, black men are incarcerated and killed at astronomical rates. So that's kind of like saying that the turtles that are, you know, born on the beach that make it to the sea are privileged, even though you may have had four, 400 born and 10 make it. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't... You know, they, they called, you know, back in the 80s, they called this institutional decimation. So while she may experience, or while she may be frustrated by the lack of suitable partners or peer partners, and that means that black men have more opportunities to choose women because they're less of them, that in no way reflects a societal privilege given that their group rarely makes it out of these age, respective age groups between 50 and 34. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I mean, I think I think the one way is to talk about facts. The other thing is to talk about what are the actual conditions of black people, like black males, right, in terms of education, in terms of mortality. Black men die extremely, you know, almost a decade earlier than most groups. Uh, they die from, you know, all kind of diseases that could be preventable. Um, you know, is the, the talk about the rate of poverty, talk about the rate of unemployment, talk about the fact that most black men work blue-collar jobs, where most black women work, work some kind of white-collar job, right? Like, these are all very real disparities that exist within black men or amongst black men and black women that have to be taken seriously if she wants to, I guess, insist that there's a notion of black male privilege, you know, that allows black men to kind of pick of the litter, so to speak. Um, you know, again, it's, it's it's kind of a pop culture ideology that's not really based on, you know, material facts. Like, she may experience the world that way, right, because she's like, oh, you know, black men get to choose or be with three or four different women and da-da-da. But that does, her experience doesn't mean that that's actually what's happening. That's a function of some very real demographic inequities um, mm -hmm. that have to be discussed, you know, on that basis as well. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. You can't, you can't say, like, you may experience that this one guy gets, you know, to talk to five, six, seven women because everybody's trying to get this one guy. But that happens because black men are being exterminated, and he's the one that got through, right? And then the, the whole point, though, is that even though he got through, given the stressors that affect him throughout life, he's still going to die earlier than you by almost a decade. So, you know, is, is, is it really a question of what you're reading as privilege, right? Thank you, Th thank you, Doctor Curry, and thank you, Gus. No, but sir, please be um, hit me up. Um, my email is tjcurry at tamu dot edu. Um, if you don't mind, send me a back shell. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for calling in to share that. That's uh, profound. Um, I think this is uh, we've got all our callers. Uh, the person at six four nine two six four nine two. Did you have a question for Doctor Curry? I did. Um, thank you for taking my call. Um, just uh, rather quickly, I um, heard you say earlier, uh, mention earlier about normalized racism. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, that sort of concept kind of came to me, kind of interacting with some of these um, um, Trump supporters on, mm -hmm. on Twitter. And so, um, you know, because anything that happens, oh no, it couldn't be racism. It's not racism. You're mean for calling me racist, and, and that and that kind of thing. And um, and actually, I think in a sense, this Trump effect is kind of the license that he's giving these people with the. You know, they've always had this, these racist tendencies to to do you know outrageous things like hitting people in the face in in, in the in public on camera. And so I was wondering if, if you could um, maybe give me a little bit more of, um, you know, what you mean by normalized racism and, and more specifically what, what kind of things kind of counter normalized racism. That's a great question. Um, so, yeah, I mean, normalized racism is, is simply going to be the idea. I mean, Joe Fagan uses the term systemic racism. Uh, it's, it's simply the idea that this is part of the normal culture or patterns of behavior. Um, that white people uh, endorse or support in their everyday living. Um, 
on the other hand, in terms of how we address it, I mean, that's the, that's the million-dollar question, right? Um, there's very little evidence that white people change based on moral or rational suasion, right? So you can't, you, there is very little that suggests that we can simply re-socialize white people through arguments or through them becoming aware of uh, certain kind of racial inequities that exist within society. Um, in fact, I mean, I'm, I remember a few, <laughs> one or two studies I think I, 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 pre- I read that said that, uh, you know, making them more aware of racism actually makes them more racist, right, because of the, the, the kind of re- caustic reactions they have. So I think that that's kind of a failed strategy. I think the premise of integrationism and, and certainly school desegregation has failed. Um, so on the other hand, uh, how do you address this? Uh, you know, I think that some of these strategies have to be political strategies, right? They have to move beyond moral suasion to concrete questions of economics and political power. Um, do segregated neighborhoods uh, actually enable um, black people to hold more voting power? Is there a benefit to, um, you know, our own currencies? Is there a call for revolution or violence over peaceful process? I mean, these are the ways that we deal with these other aspects of normalized racism because these other aspects of normalized racism are fundamentally trying to deny black people resources and communities, denying them health services, the increasing, this, you know, increased surveillance of them, right? So these are the problems. So the question really becomes how do you address those aspects of uh, enforcing white supremacy? And, you know, and that's something that's been debated for almost a century in this country, or maybe probably a little more. Wow. That, well, that was kind of my thought, but um, but there's, you know, not, an understanding a lot of people have tried, but I just can't see this continuing, you know, forever, right? Cause, yeah. yeah, I mean... You know, I mean, it's so funny because you know, in my in my field, you know, I work a lot on Derek Bell, and um, you know, it, it's kind of one of those things where you're you're like, you know, Derek's thesis was racism is permanent, and you know, people have a really hard time accepting that, and when you look at the actual structures of racism in society. See, that doesn't mean that racism doesn't change. It just means that racism develops in the sense that it is the permanent disposition and character of American society, that when you have a change, it will change back, or if you have progress, that progress will push back. Um, what what you have currently is this view that there is a end to racism, that we can anticipate it even though we've never been in an anti-racist moment where it hasn't been there with us. So I think that there has to be some kind of um, conceptual adjustments, you know, uh, to, to how we think, to how we think about, um, you know, what's actually going on uh, in, in America and, and then what we could do to actually adjust and remedy that. Right, I, would, I, I can see that in that it's covering every area of people activity. Mm. And so, so in a way you can't escape it because... You, you have to do, you know, economic transactions and religion, law, especially law. Law is it's, it's at so many levels that, um, you know, I don't know. Like, like you just said that, I, I was hoping you had a, an answer. But when you when you think it had a beginning, though, then then you can say, well, there must be an end of this at one point. Yeah. Or, I mean, I mean, of course. I mean, if you, I mean, if you're talking about just my personal opinion, I think racism ends when America ends. I don't see, I don't see an upshot where you're gonna. Because I mean, because what you're talking about in, cha- in order to change racism is completely uprooting basically every structure we have, economics, pol- politics, courts. You know, all this is uprooted and fundamentally changed. And in all the time that black people have been here, you haven't seen an integration or respect of the humanity of black people that allows people to make decisions that are not biased. I mean, when you look at the implicit bias literature, when you look at the conscious racist literature, when you look at the systemic racist literature, you look at the disparate, you know, all these things show that there hasn't been much progress in race in this country despite the pretense. So unless you're for, like, mass revolution, right, it's very difficult to specifically talk about a piecemeal reform that's going to change the overall dynamic. So you may come up with a policy like, um, 
you know, reversing the Supreme Court decision on the Fourth Amendment, right, that allows, you know, you may be able to change those aspects of racism, but that's just, that's changing who has the benefit of the doubt of the police stop. That doesn't change economics. It doesn't change racial profile. It doesn't change conviction rates. You see what I'm saying? It's it's just it's just not one whole it's not one thing that changes the the overall you know function of racism in the country. Mm. Thanks for uh, your uh, participation, Joy. Good to hear from you. Good person. Uh, our caller in Wisconsin slipped uh, slipped a hand in. Uh, Rob in Wisconsin, did you have a question for uh, Dr. Curry? You should be with us, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> greetings, Gus, and greetings, Dr. Curry. Uh, got kicked out of the line and uh, forgot to get my hand back up. Sorry for uh, dialing in so late. But uh, I just had a quick question. I heard him speak uh, to uh, black males having an early sexual experience and that being linked to violence. And just wanted him to uh, expound on that and unpack that a little bit. And thank you for taking the call. No, no, thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, one of the things that the literature on on um, early black male or early male sexual experience explains is that the trauma of statutory rape is internalized by young black men, which means that they develop a distrust of females' uh, partners. Um, of relationships, they have problems with commitment. Uh, they also usually have higher risk, you know, risk your sexual behavior, uh, which usually leads to at least one pregnancy in that group. Uh, so we're talking about people who generally are losing their virginities or having their first sexual experiences between the ages of six or uh, sixteen uh, in most of the literature. So why does that happen? Well. There's an internalization of distrust, um, of feeling vulnerable and defenseless. Uh, and because men don't usually receive treatments or an understanding for trauma, that internalization becomes anger, anxiety, depression. Uh, and then when that is that kind of condition is forced to interact with another, you know, woman or uh, man or, you know, anyone else that makes them feel vulnerable that kind of triggers that, then you usually see uh, intimate partner violence. Uh, unfortunately, the literature on black men is not as developed as it is in general uh, towards men, but these, these seem to be just, you know, the literature says that those are general effects and consequences of men who are victims of uh, sexual violence, and specifically female perpetrated sexual violence. And this is one of the reasons that, um, you know, me and a few other scholars have taken so much time to try to accumulate, you know, and document the stories and analyze them um, and kind of put them next to the mainstream literature in terms of what's actually happening to young black boys and men uh, who experience this trauma. Uh, one of the things I'm really interested in is what happens to men who internalize this over years, you know, because they have these early sexual experiences or the experiences of statutory rape, be it a statutory relationship or forcible rape, and there's just not a lot of venues uh, to speak about it, uh, which is why I try to encourage, um, you know, black men who've had these these kinds of events to, uh, you know, contact me or uh, reach out to a study of a colleague of mine. Um, I should have provided a link. Uh, but, you know, those types of things are, are what we're trying to do to accumulate these studies and actually start addressing some of the disparity in this population. That answered your question, uh, Rob? Answer this question. I think he's still uh, still with us. This uh, for sure. Our last caller, folks, uh, waiting a little late to dial in. Uh, the caller at zero nine nine seven zero nine nine seven. Did you have a question for Dr. Curry? Uh, yes, I just wanted to ask. After uh, so much uh, psychological and physical trauma over so much time in a country that's basically built on rape, what do you think the ramifications of that are societally? Mm. Like for a country like like our society that's built on rape? Yes, sir. Um, I think it's what you get now. <laughs> I think, look, I mean, the pra see, the practice of rape, I mean, when you look historically, um, has 
has a lot of origins in colonial structures. So at least the way that we think of rape from the 1700s forward um, is in that basis, right? When you're when you're talking about the carnal knowledge of women, this is coming from the idea and the imagery that you know settlers and 19th century colonialists had of Native men raping white women. So. The idea isn't that rape is bad. The idea is just rape is bad when it happens to white people because those are the people who actually have a kind of sanctity about their body. It's the same thing with murder. If you live in a society that doesn't that, that doesn't believe that black people are indigenous people or, you know, Latin descended people are, are human, then the idea is that they don't have a sanctity to their body, so they're disposable. White people use their bodies the way they want, which is why you had white men raping black men. That's why you had white women raping black men, which is why you had white men raping black women. And I haven't found any evidence of it yet, but I'm willing to say that white women were raping black women too, right? Um, in all these kinds of relationships, uh, or I should say victimizations, you know, uh, because they're, they're certainly rape and sexual exploitation, these are about the fundamental power in relationship to how people desire certain bodies. So if I'm a white woman and I desire a black man to be my sex toy, if I'm a black man, and do I have power in that relationship? Absolutely not. Do I have power within slavery? Absolutely not. So the function of the society is based in that kind of disposability and fungibility of black, brown, indigenous bodies. Right, So the kind of society that produces then will be the same one that takes at its core that these bodies are disposable and subject to the will of the dominant ruling class, which are white people. So the same thing we see with police castrating or shocking or raping or anally penetrating you know, black males is no real shocker because they did that well into the, you know, the 19th century. They did it during Reconstruction. They did it during slavery. So – these kinds of patterns of domination and brutality just constantly coexist and develop. It's just that we don't talk about them as much now because we're not in the Jim Crow South and we're certainly not with, within chattel slavery. So, but basically, though, we're still operating under the premise that it's the will of the master and the slave is still functioning under, under the will of the master, where the, where the will of the master is, is, is power. Absolutely, yeah. That's what, that's what I was exactly going to say, right? The will of the master is the kind of power it has to make the recognition of certain traumas to bodies visible. So if I can rape a black man with a screwdriver, which is what happened to Caprez in Chicago, and then just say, well, that's just policing and nobody cares because either they don't believe it happened or they just don't care that it happened, then, you know, they have the complete power to do whatever they want to black male bodies, Right? That's the, that's the will of society. Like the, you know, people don't understand that the part of, part of racism isn't just that people commit violence. Part of racism is that you dehumanize people to such a level that the violence committed against them isn't recognized as violence. And that's exactly what happened to police brutality for so long. How long do we know that black men were stopped by cops and shot and killed? How long have we known that black men have been locked up? Right? It's the, the dehumanizing part of racism is we know these facts and we simply don't care. So that's the society that's produced. We talk about rape culture all the time. Where oh, you know, nobody cares about these women who are raped. To a certain extent, absolutely. Mostly, though, we don't care about poor women who are raped. If we're being honest about it, but generally, under that general idea, you know, the idea is that those people are invisible. Why are they invisible? Because you don't value women's bodies. Yet you take the same kind of logic, the same actual argument, and apply it to black people, and suddenly people don't want to believe that one of the functions of racism is this implicit dehumanization that has us to be completely indifferent to certain groups suffering. And then when you show that the people that's most affected by this kind of degradation and dehumanization are black and male, then there's a complete disowning of facts. So whereas many Denial. people try to use facts to situate the vulnerability of women, like in terms of how many people are raped, the rate of victimization, the prevalence of it on college campuses, they try to appeal to some kind of notion of numbers. We have the numbers for black men. They're like, yeah, it doesn't work out the way we want. Let's dismiss it. So that's the society you create, one where even other black people have the power to take advantage of a dehumanized status of black males, or you have the power to take advantage of the dehumanized status of the black poor, right? That's, that's what happens. You know, it's kind of strange. I was reading some things on what is rape, and that's where I found it to be quite fascinating. A certain types of penetration, if it's not vaginal, if it's, if it's rectal, it's, it's not considered rape. And I found that to be insanity. That's well, actually, my, that definition recently changed. So in 2013, okay. January 1st, 2013, the UCR um, changed to 
um, any penetration are being made to penetrate, you know. So now, now it it it, inclu- it includes anal penetration, or forced vaginal penetration, or forced anal penetration. So you know, it's it's more expansive. But you know, most people don't even know the definition of rape. Like I've constantly been in conversations with people where they're saying something's rape, and I'm like, well, that's not the definition anymore. Right, but you're absolutely right. Because under the legacy definition, before you know, like before 2013, anal penetration wouldn't have been, or the penetration, you know, of a man in that way would have not would not have necessarily been considered rape. Would have been considered um, either made to penetrate or sexual assault, or I forgot. Is it? I think it's sexual assault or uh, abuse. Because one of them, uh, I, I believe, if I'm if I'm right, was oral was not considered rape, and I and and and, and guys walk for that. I mean, for yeah. forcibly. And I, I, I just found it to be insanity. I mean, no, this forcing is... somebody to do anything against their will using force. I mean, it's, I don't know. No, I mean, look, I, I think you're absolutely right. But you know, like I said, I think that part of the part of the issue is is that we don't have the cultural sensibilities to recognize rape or the trauma uh, that 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 notion causes for black people. Right. So even in our communities, you know, I mean, a lot of the stuff that that you have to start with when you look at the literature on the rape of black men and boys is you have to start with like NPR interviews. Like it's just not out there. You know, you may get a paragraph in different in different books that mention it. So the the literature is so small that you just don't have a basis to talk about the sexual dehumanization of black men and boys. So when these things happen. Is not is not just that people think it, you're right because you're I agree with you it's ridiculous we don't have a language for it but it's that people haven't even developed a theory to explain it so there's there's just nothing there you know it's kind of like you're at ground zero so what I'm hoping is that the work that I'm doing with these other scholars um, really does allow us uh, to kind of fill up fill in that hole. Yeah. Thank you, thank you thank for you. your uh, commentary, sir. Um, there was a yes, listener. Sir. She just wrote in. She wanted to know, uh, Dr. Curry, if you could, uh, could you give some words of encouragement for black people who are having a difficult time navigating through their lives dealing with racism, white supremacy? I uh, thought that would be a, I guess, uplifting note to uh, okay. conclude on. Well, I mean, listen, you know, our, our people have survived slavery and the very deliberate attempts at, at racial genocide. So there is something to be said about the resilience of our people. But what we can't do is mistake the resilience that we have and the resistance strategies that we've adopted to be the optimal point of our people. In other words, we can't define the negative position in which we're constantly battling white supremacy to be our humanity. See, that's the trick of white supremacy is that we define our blackness as dependent on them. And when you look at what we've created, when you've looked at our strategies, when you looked at our art, when you looked at our politics, when you look at our notions of humanity that are so much richer and deeper than anything that you can find within the Western canon of philosophy, then what you see is that the potentiality of the human being that's being denied by white people is, in fact, their shame. It's them finding that their notions of humanity itself is wanting and that we've created, in fact, superior systems of being that they can't yet comprehend. Well, put something to aspire for. I think that's important. I think that's the point you touched on a few times this evening uh, in kind of deceiving us into think of the notion of equality being equal with whites uh, when we should have notions way, way light years uh, beyond that thought. Um, Always, as I stated, a pleasure to have you on the program. As I said, uh, tons of our listening audience always look forward to you being able to share some of your time on the program. You said your book is coming out for July. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, it should be out July 1st, 2017. Um, on Temple University Press, the, the man, not race, class, genre, and the dilemmas of black manhood. Outstanding. Hopefully, we will uh, speak with you before then, but we certainly will be looking forward to uh, reading it hot off the presses and uh, picking up a copy. I'm sure a lot of listeners will be looking forward to getting your literature, adding it to their library as well. I hope uh, so. Just, I hope so. 
Thanks again for sharing some of your time. We really appreciate it. I know you have lots of stuff that you're working on, so just we're always grateful when you can stop through and chat with us. Uh, again, our guest, Dr. Tommy J. Curry. Uh, we will be looking forward uh, to checking out some of your pieces. I'll encourage listeners, you can also go to uh, academia.edu, uh, Dr. Curry's page. It's linked in the description for the program. You can see uh, the essay that I referenced this evening. He's a co-author of that report and a lot of the other uh, documents, reports that he has written over the years. He has them there. You can check out a lot of his scholarship right there at academia.edu. Thank you again, Dr. Curry. We will definitely be in touch with you soon, good sir. Yes, sir. It's, it's always a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. For sure. Enjoy the rest of your evening, Dr. Curry. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Context of white supremacy. Always grand to hear uh, from Dr. Curry. Um, if you need help finding the page, if you want the specific report uh, that he co-authored, uh, read a bit from that this evening, uh, you make me want to holler and throw up both my hands, Campus Culture, Black Misandric Microaggressions and Racial Battle Fatigue. Uh, really uh, interesting report there. Uh, I'm going to uh, follow up on his request, or not request, recommendation rather, uh, about seeing if we can get uh, the lead author in the study, William A. Smith, Dr. William A. Smith. He's at the uh, University of Utah. I'm going to see if we can try. I can down and get him on the program, uh, hopefully within the next uh, month or so. Uh, at any rate, I did want to make sure I got in as well. I was going to say it at the beginning, had a uh, cough drop in my mouth for a good portion of the program. I'm a, a bit congested, uh, so it might be coming through uh, in my voice and how I'm sounding and what have you. And as I said, I did have a cough drop in my mouth for a good uh, portion of the program. So if uh, it caused a disruption or people thought I was snacking while we were doing the program, that is the explanation. Uh, at any rate, we'll be here on Wednesday. Uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, as I stated, it was in the New York Times just within uh, last week, uh, just days ago, literally, uh, where they had a great report talking about a renewed effort uh, to combat the chemical and biological warfare in the form of cigarettes against black people. I thought it was great information. Number one, some of this I had seen before. This is not the first time I'd seen this. Uh, for folks who have been listening to the cows, Renee Randall, she was on the program, uh, well, she's been on many times, but the very first time she visited with us was in 2009, uh, her book, Dying While Black. She's in Ohio. We had our call talking about the uh, suffering of black boys in Ohio's public school system. Uh, she was on in 2009. We discussed her book, and she has a whole section where she talks about tobacco product, uh, tobacco products uh, being marketed to black people and specifically menthol cigarettes uh, and how they are especially addictive uh, and the damage that they do to black people. We talked about that in detail uh, back then on 2009. Uh, and then this report last week in the New York Times was talking about the exact same thing and they had the research that tobacco companies have deliberately targeted, marketed menthol cigarettes to black people, especially Newports. I think that's the popular uh, brand of cigarettes for many uh, black people. I know I worked, uh, when I worked in Atlanta at a black comedy club, they used to get uh, menthol cigarettes as a promotional item. And I mean, they would get them by like the crate load, not just a pack or what have you, crates of them. Uh, would come and they had them stacked. I mean, they had to find, you know, areas to stack all these menthol cigarettes that they would get in that you could, you're supposed to just give out to uh, overwhelmingly black patrons uh, who are coming to the club. And I remember, I think, all the black people that smoked there, certainly not everybody smoked, but all the black males that I remember who smoked, they smoked menthol cigarettes. Uh, but that'll be coming up uh, this coming Wednesday. Again, that report that I think uh, folks might want to check out, Melanin and Nicotine, uh, our guest for Thursday program. She's one of the co-authors uh, of the report, and it has a lot of interesting information. As I said, I really wish I was familiar with this research uh, before the transition of Dr. Frances Cress Welsing, because I would have been very eager uh, to hear her thoughts uh, on this. Uh, she was such a, a consummate scholar, I would suspect that she was familiar with uh, some of this information, or she wasn't, to uh, just kind of get her thoughts on it. Uh, daily reminded of uh, the colossal loss of Dr. Welsing, but that'll be Wednesday. Tune in. I'm sure we have some smokers in our listening audience if you need 
additional motivation uh, to uh, put down the cigarettes, as I've been saying, that is included uh, when I say sobriety would be best under conditions of white supremacy. That for sure includes tobacco products. Uh, with that, I'm going to try to rest my voice, uh, make sure that I'm ready to roll uh, for Wednesday, particularly since I'm doing the narration for the spook who sat by the door, second installment coming up Friday. I hope I'm not sounding uh, too bad uh, to get ready to do the reading. Uh, I will take, uh, if there's one comment a uh, person needs to get in, I'm not uh, hanging out to do a whole lot, but if anybody has one quick comment they need to get in before we wrap up, uh, Feel free. If not, we will get ready to uh, conclude the broadcast. Anybody need one thing to get in before we conclude? Everyone's satisfied? That's wonderful as well. <laughs> Everybody satisfied? Grand. I will assume, folks, everybody is uh, taken care of for the broadcast. Um, if you have questions, guest suggestions, if you have problems finding something in the archives, feel free to drop us an email until justice at gmail dot com. Until justice at gmail dot com. We are on Twitter at until justice at until justice. Uh, feel free to drop a question. I try to respond as uh, quickly as possible. Uh, again, we are listener supported. Count Racist Radio, visit the blog racism-notes.blogspot.com, racism-notes.blogspot.com. PayPal button is in the top right corner. If you are not into PayPal, drop us an email and we will get you a physical mailing address. Huge thanks to all the folks who have supported and invested nearly eight years that we have been broadcasting. I hope we have helped folks get a better understanding of what white supremacy racism is, how it works. Uh, make sure you are getting something constructive, investing your time listening to these broadcasts. If you are not getting valuable, practical information that you can implement, help you solve problems, erase some of your confusion, then please find something better to do with your time and energy. We cannot be wasting time as victims of white terrorism. Uh, with that, uh, we will be here in 48 hours. Uh, I'm looking forward uh, this week, and I hope I will be feeling a, a bit better to reading. There was a report in the uh, New York Times, I'm sure it was elsewhere, where President Obama was out stumping for Hillary Clinton, and he was talking directly to black people because there's been all these reports uh, citing concerns, saying that lots of black people are suspicious of Hillary Clinton and they are not enthused about her campaign and they're not going out to cast a ballot for her. And so President Obama said that he would take it as a personal insult, in quotes, if black people did not rally and support Hillary Clinton. And uh, it, is, it is an amazing article uh, to check out. Uh, I think I'm going to read the whole thing in its entirety uh, on the program. I, I just I laughed and laughed and laughed and chuckled. Uh, it, although it is, it's not funny, uh, it is definitely something that is worthy of uh, critical evaluation. But that was in the New York Times, I think, today. I'm not sure if it was in the physical paper today, but I know it was on the uh, digital page. If you go to their site, you'll see it. I posted it on my Facebook page uh, with a few side comments as well. But we will uh, review that as we roll. Fascinating season to be uh, during an election year. Thanks for folks tuning in. Glad you got your commentary. We will uh, speak with you in about 48 hours. Uh, with that, Creator, we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people, victim. of white supremacy, we ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times, in all places, each and every time we are in contact with another black person. It has been time to replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Kyle signing out. Thanks all for tuning in. Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim, no brother. Problem. A victim. Right. I'm a up. victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm -hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned. Ah.